All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are recording and broadcasting. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. Well, welcome everyone to the February meeting of the Delta Independent Science Board. And uh, as uh, in the past, we will be conducting this meeting remotely due to COVID. We still welcome uh, public comments. If, if you have written comments and questions, you can email them directly to disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov. And if you have oral comments today, you can uh, use the raise hand function or send an email to the same email address. And uh, when you're recognized, you'll have uh, three minutes to talk and state your name and affiliation uh, and then uh, and then give us your public comment. And we do welcome public comments. So I'd like to go ahead and take a roll call and see if anyone has any uh, <clears throat> new um, uh, declarations. And I'm Steve Brandt and no new declarations. So. Uh, uh, Joe? No new declarations. Uh, Tom? No new declarations. Okay, Tanya? Tanya Heikola, I have one declaration. Uh, I'll be participating as a panelist for a three-part seminar series on Delta governance that's organized by the Delta Science Program, and specifically I'll be a panelist on the third seminar on May 5th, 2022. So join us for the seminar. Okay, Jay. Uh, no new declarations, day one. Uh, Bob. Bob Nyman, uh, no new declarations. Lisa. Lisa Wanger, no new declarations. Okay, we are, uh, Diane McKnight will be joining us in about 10, 10 minutes and you know, we're still missing Virginia, but we do have a, a quorum to move forward. Um, so today's, uh, we have a long uh, meeting today uh, in the morning, and uh, we're largely going to be looking at uh, talking about our continuing reviews and about uh, possible new reviews. And then uh, we will take a break exactly at 11 o'clock because of a scheduling conflict. So at 11 o'clock, we will have a break for about an hour. And... Uh, and then uh, in the afternoon, we'll be talking about uh, uh, getting some presentations about uh, fish and food webs near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and that will be uh, sort of uh, in line of potential uh, reviews that we are thinking about. See, Virginia has uh, joined us. Virginia, any new declarations? No, I have no new declarations. My regrets for being late. No problem. Okay, we'll move on to item uh, number two on the agenda, which is the chair's report. <clears throat> uh, I first wanted to point out that uh, in your packet of information, we have uh, uh, some public comments, written public comments we've received, uh, one from the California Water Research, Research, which provided uh, correspondence on the operations of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project, updates from the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resilience Program, and a comment on network weaving in uh, in the re related to the DPIC restoration subcommittee efforts. The second one in your packet is the Central Data Water Agency. That's Tom Zuckerman, who gave us a, a verbal um, comment. He provided written comments on the public presentations to us during our January 12th meeting on the Delta Water Project and Central Valley Project and the Delta Conveyance. And then the third item is the Sierra Club shared a white paper on alternatives to the Delta Conveyance Project. <clears throat> the second thing I'd like to report on is the uh, um, is we submitted our final uh, comments on the science action agenda that was submitted on January 28th, and you should have a copy of that in your in your packet. Thirdly, I want to bring you up on the status of the. MER, the Monitoring Enterprise Review, the uh, all of the uh, changes that that have been, if you recall, we uh, passed on the content of that. We had received some public comments and some edits and things like that. So we went through the report and, and completed a uh, thorough sort of re-editing of that to make to uh, make clarifications relative to those comments. And it's in its final stages of polishing right now. So. I'd imagine fairly shortly it'll be turned over to the uh, uh, program staff for uh, publication. 
Uh, another item on my um, agenda is to talk about the two uh, postdocs that we have advertised. That uh, search process has largely been completed. We're in the final stages of making those appointments. We're hopeful that uh, um, within a week or so, we should have those appointments finalized. One individual is expected to start March 1st, and the second individual is expected to start April 1st. Uh, I think all of you know the background of this, but this, uh, these uh, postdocs were requested uh, to do things above and beyond what we normally have had uh, program staff do. And I think as part of that original request, uh, we emphasized our continual need for the excellent program staff support that we have right now with Edmund and our student fellows and, and now Lauren, we absolutely still need that full support. In fact, we expect it might even increase uh, as our board begins to evolve and take on new reviews. The postdocs will be doing their new appointments. They'll be doing something uh, different than what our program staff does. And like all postdocs, our intent is to develop something called the individual um, development plan for each of the postdocs, which lays out what the responsibilities are, it lays out the relationships between the mentor and the mentorees. There's, these postdoc positions will actually formally report to the Sea Grant, California Sea Grant director, Shauna O, oh, who will be their supervisor of record. But they will be using board members, nominally first uh, myself and, and Lisa as the chair and the chair elect, as the mentors to their individual development uh, program. So the leadership will be meeting shortly to work out uh, some of the first things we might get these, uh, these folks to, uh, uh, to begin to work on. And uh, we expect they'll provide a capability that, for example, they could take a, a particular topic we're interested in and really delve into the literature and, and uh, background and what's being done and come back and report back to us uh, specifically on the needs that might be valuable for us in terms of uh, developing reviews and so forth. That's just one example. If you have any ideas, send us some emails, but we will first come up with some uh, plans from the uh, leadership team over the next uh, week or two to, to uh, figure out um, uh, specifically how they may uh, work. We expect as soon as they're on board, we will it'll give us a presentation on their background uh, and experience so you get a chance to to know them better. The next item on my agenda is the uh, California Sea Grant Fellow update. And Allegra uh, LaFerre is a new California Sea Grant uh, Fellow. And she started on January 31st. Allegra, would you like to introduce yourself? Welcome aboard, by the way. Thank you. Uh, hello, all. Good morning. My name is Allegra LaFerre, and I'm the incoming California State Sea Grant Fellow in the Science-Based Adaptive Management Unit for the Delta Science Program. I'm a recent graduate of Scripps Institution of Oceanography's MAS MBC program, where I got my master's degree in marine biodiversity and conservation. My work uh, up until now has primarily focused on fisheries. I've explored many different aspects of fisheries in an attempt to better understand the myriad of perspectives and complexities within the field. Right out of college, I was a fisheries observer on the East Coast, where I lived and worked amongst the commercial fishermen of Long Island. Then I was a fishmonger in Los Angeles, where I got to know the consumer side of seafood. And my master's research focused on a small scale fishery in Belize. What has primarily interested me in fisheries uh, over the course of all these years is the fact that there are so many competing interests and perspectives and stakeholders. And I find the challenge of getting all of these stakeholders to the same table at the same time, extremely rewarding. So while I'm new to the Delta ecosystem, uh, I've already gleaned that there are similar concepts at play here. This year during my fellowship, I look forward to meeting and learning about all of the different state agencies that are involved and active in the Delta, learning more about the stakeholders present here. And I also look forward to seeing firsthand how science and policy can really come and work together. So thank you for your time. And I look forward to working with you all in the coming year. Well, thank you. We really uh, 
look forward to working with you. And if you do ever solve how, uh, how science and policy work together, please uh, let us know. And uh, <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve, I'd just like to thank Allegra for taking notes at our uh, subsidence working group too. So we've already put her to work. Okay, and I'd like to also remind folks that Jenica is still here and she will stay on working with us until the uh, end of March, I believe. And I know she, uh, she's doing a number of different things, including uh, uh, helping us with the uh, with the monitoring enterprise re review. And we're, uh, as we do with all C-Grant fellows, we're asking her to give us a presentation at the uh, at our March meeting before she leaves on uh, uh, things she's learned and and uh, and her experience as a C-Grant fellow. So I think that's all I have on my report. Oh, I wanted to also mention that. Um, We've been talking with the council about uh, giving presentations uh, of our reports. Remember, we're required to, uh, when we finalize a report, to make a presentation to the council. And although we haven't set specific dates or times or who's doing it, we're looking probably at um, uh, April, May, and June, and uh, three different presentations. One would be on um, the monitoring enterprise review the second would be on the um, uh, water supply reliability, assuming that gets passed today and we're, we're near completion. And we don't want to make that presentation until the, the products are more or less out. And then a third one is we, we normally do an annual report to the, uh, to the council on what we've done over the past year and, and more importantly, what we are intend to do over the next coming year. So we're thinking about that um, possibly as early as June to do that when we'll, we'll have a better sort of feel for where we're at in terms of future reviews and activities. So that's the end of my report. Are there any, any of you have any questions or comments or thoughts? Okay, is there, are there any public comments on this item? Edmund. Um, yes, we have one from Deirdre Deirdre Dan. Um, Deirdre, you have permission to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation before providing your public comment. Thank you. Um, thank you. This is uh, Deirdre Deirdre Dan, uh, and I'm commenting from my uh, cell phone. Um, uh, so excuse me if the audio is a little bit rough. Um, so. There is for literature review, um, the Department of Water Resources took, had 100,000 documents on their website that they took down because of their interpretation of laws on accessibility. Um, of, of, um, remediate, the, the documents um, reportedly have to be remediated. Um, the state archivist, um, uh, the, the California State Library has requested copies of the documents, as has Maven's notebook, the California Water Library, but to date they've only, they have, the, the state archivist hasn't been given them, and uh, um, Maven's notebook has gotten some, but um, not many. So it is an issue. Um, it, I may have relevant documents squirreled away when you're doing a literature review, and um, I might be able to help with some of that. Um, we are trying to continue to advocate for the documents. In addition, uh, the Natural Resources Agency used to have a resources library, and apparently it no longer has a central location. Um, so, um, and the IEP library is uh, in a physical location, um, but um, there isn't access, public access at this point. So it is uh, an issue and one that um, we NGOs are aware of and we're very much trying to work on it. Um, but I just wanted to let you know, because there, there is some uh, really important information in the gray literature. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, public comment. We know that uh, access to these documents are extremely important. And I know that we went through a stage where many of our products were uh, uh, more of a challenge to get access to. So thank you. Any other public comments, Edmund? There are none, thank you. 
Okay, we'll move on to item number three, which is the uh, Delta Council Chair's report. And Susan, are you taking the lead on that? Ah, yes. Hi, Steve. Hi, Hi. everyone. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, this morning, I just wanted to give uh, some highlights from the our last meeting. Uh, I'll be giving just a really short overview of our annual report, uh, which was completed. It's it's a it's a really good encapsulation of the work. Uh, we did in 2021, and then Amanda Bowl, our uh, special assistant for for planning and science, will give an overview of our environmental justice issue paper and uh, the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee uh, Restoration Subcommittee. So, for the annual report, um, this report is uh, is each year. I I think our annual reports are improving and. And this one is it, fabulous. It's just, it looks great. It's concise. Um, the theme is building resilience amid rapid change. And uh, it reports progress on our major initiatives. Uh, there's a good, uh, very short overview on Delta ADAPTS and the completion of the vulnerability assessment, the first ever for the Delta region. Uh, it also talks about our Delta plan chapter four ecosystem chapter amendment, which is a, a major endeavor. Of course, it talks about our performance measures and the progress on the performance measures and uh, includes a short write up on the Delta plan, the Delta Independent Science Board and the um, the draft reviews on the water supply reliability and the monitoring enterprise and and um, uh, the science on non-native species. So I encourage you uh, to please go to our website, take a look at the the uh, annual report. It's it's really well done. So now I'll hand it over to Amanda for the uh, the environmental justice issue paper and the restoration subcommittee. Great, thanks, Susan, and good morning, IC members. Um, so again, Amanda Bull, Special Assistant for Planning and Science with the Delta Stewardship Council. And I'm gonna update you on the status of a couple of items. I'm gonna switch back and forth, a couple different hats here this morning. First, I'll present on um, the environmental justice issue paper that the council is in the process of developing. And then I'll switch gears a bit and update you all on the outcome of the first DPIC restoration subcommittee. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the council is undertaking this effort and has um, been working on this for uh, well over a year now. Um, and uh, just give you a little bit of background on, on why and, um, and just be a little bit of history on this. So in, in recent years, the state of California has made environmental justice a priority and many of the council's peer state agencies have recently adopted or in the process of developing an environmental, environmental justice print policies, principles and guidelines. So the council's five-year review, which we completed in I believe, 2019, identified environmental justice as a key emerging issue, noting a specific need for more information and analysis to inform potential future actions. Uh, the survey, survey responses and stakeholder interviews for the five-year review highlighted environmental justice concerns relating to all three categories of, of environmental justice, recognition, process, and distribution. Uh, and so the council recommended that an issue paper be prepared to investigate the potential need for additional strategies or responses within the Delta plan to address disadvantaged communities and environmental justice. So council members discussed these findings at its 2019 council retreat and at the May 2019 and August 2019 council meetings and endorsed the final findings and recommendations presented at the October 2019 council meeting, which included the, the development of the EJ issue paper. So, you know, drawing upon the five-year review, uh, the public participation plan that the council approved last year, maybe the year before, um, as well as the Delta, Delta ADAPTS outreach process, staff has developed the following objectives for this project. Um, first, to build a network of community leaders and organizations to inform and support the council's environmental justice work. Second, to identify envir environmental justice issues within the Delta, the Delta watershed and areas that use Delta water, and also to identify options to address those issues, just really what things can the Delta Stewardship Council do um, within its purview. 
once the issue paper is complete, implementation options will be presented for council consideration, and then uh, council members will then direct staff regarding options to carry forward. So to date, um, as I mentioned, we did start this process last year, um, and we started it by conducting an analysis of public comments to get a preliminary sense of the issues relevant to community members in the Delta. And of the 368 comments reviewed, 278 were from comment letters and 90 from oral comments. And 53 of, of, of all these comments raised issues related to environmental justice. Oh, next slide, please, sorry. Um, in addition to, so following the public comment analysis, oh, last, next, go back one slide, thanks. Um, is also, um, we are in the process of conducting a number of interviews. Um, we determined that one of our key data collection activities for this, this paper would be to conduct interviews with EJ organizations and community-based organizations in order to hear directly from EJ advocates and groups working on the front lines of these issues uh, to find out what the problems are, how they're affecting different communities, and then what solutions should be explored to address these issues. Um, an interview guide was reviewed by EJ scholars and EJ expert groups, and then by the UC San Diego Institutional Review Board in order to ensure that best practices and ethical research with human subjects were followed. Um, so we are currently reaching out to EJ organizations and uh, community-based organizations in the Bay and the Delta who are working on EJ issues uh, to seek voluntary participants for the interviews. Um, so far, we have conducted 11 interviews already. Um, we would like to get to 30. We're not sure if we will, but that's what we're, we're shooting for. Um, and I'm hesitant to say too much about what we're hearing from those interviews right now because we are still so early in, in, in collecting that information or gathering um, that information. Um, in, addition to the ex in addition to the interviews, um, we've also formed an EJ expert group. Um, we have contracts with, the, with at this point, um, three and are working on a fourth. Um, and um, we are contracting with these organizations so that we can compensate them for their time. Um, and at this point, we have held, I believe, three meetings um, and are gearing up for a fourth. We're currently convening the expert group on, group on a monthly basis um, to um, talk to them about current uh, Delta Stewardship Council responsibilities and activities. And then as we get closer to um, collecting our interview data, analyzing that and, and coming up with recommendations for the issue paper, we'll also be um, sharing that information with them and asking for their feedback as well. Um, we've also done a couple of other things um, to assist in the development of the EJ issue paper. Um, we have conducted a literature review. We've reviewed 36 papers and are now weaving the relevant literature into, um, into the historical context and background component of, of the issue paper. Uh, last year, we held four public EJ seminars uh, hearing from experts in water justice, government, EJ work, indigenous and climate justice. And we had approximately 75 to 100 attendees at each of these seminars. And then we're also um, developing a public engagement process um, so that we're not just meeting with our, our expert groups, but also reaching out to the communities. And we are working closely with our expert group members to, to, um, to really collaborate with them in, in, in the outreach that we're doing so that we know that we are, are reaching community members where they are. Um, Next slide, please. So next steps for this process is, um, you know, we're really going to be spending winter and spring on um, um, focusing on the interviews and getting those interviews completed, uh, scheduled and completed, um, begin analyzing that information. Uh, we'll continue to develop and begin to implement the public engagement process, uh, weaving information um, into the lit review historical context and to start doing some other drafting of the paper. Um, late summer, we are hoping to have a review draft of the issue paper, and then um, our hope is to, by late fall, early winter 2023, to finalize the issue paper and to um, present it to the council for their consideration. So I'm happy to, and before I switch gears to the Deepak Restoration Subcommittee, uh, I'm happy to take questions on um, the EJ effort. Go ahead, Bob. You're on mute. I finally figured that out. <laughs> uh, Amanda, I'm curious about your expert group. Uh, who are the members of the group? And could you uh, tell us a little bit about their background? Sure, yeah. So we have Barbara barragan who is the executive director of Restore the Delta based in Stockton. Um, she's a community advocate, has been working in the Delta on Delta issues for, gosh, probably well over a decade at this point. Um, Bob Erlenbush, who is um, uh, the head of the Sacramento Regional Coalition to End Homelessness. He's also been working on homelessness issues um, in the Sacramento region for 15 years. And before that, he worked in Southern California 
um, also on homeless issues for a decade or two. Um, we have Matt Holmes, who is with Little Manila Rising, which is a community-based organization in, in Stockton as well. Uh, again, a longtime community advocate in the Stockton area. Uh, we have Sherry Norris, who is, um, and then our last member is Sherry Norris, who is the executive director of the California Indian Environmental Alliance. So. Well, that's great. Uh, uh, just to follow up, uh, are there tribal members? Yeah, so Sherry Norris um, is, uh, is our tribal representative, and we are actually also trying to um, reach out to additional tribes to, um, to try and increase the tribal um, um, engagement on this process, or on the expert group as well. well that's great, thank you. Okay, Tom. Amanda, who are the groups and their relative sizes that are affected by this environmental justice issue? Um, well, I mean, it, it varies. I mean, you know, the groups that we have involved in um, in the expert group. So, you know, we've got Barbara, Barrick, and Perea. So really Restore the Delta was started more as a response to conveyance and, and, and those impacts, but they have really expanded their work to work in the communities affected by environmental justice issues. So these are folks that um, in general, um, you know, that you know, organization people, and I think Little Manila Rising is actually a, probably a better example. You know, you've got, they have a lot of members and a lot of community members that rely on the Delta for subsistence farm or uh, subsistence fishing. Um, and so they're, they're affected by the mercury in the water and in the fish. And then we've got people that are affected by, um, uh, by, uh, um, you know, haves in the Delta during the, you know, and the, you know, folks that don't know that they can't go into the water. And so we've got community groups that are, you know, representing, um, you know, locals and folks that want to go, you know, fishing and swimming in the water, but can't because there's, there's that. So, um, and so the organizations, um, uh, you know, are folks that, um, like I said, Restore the Delta has really expanded their reach to include more environmental justice issues, Restore the Delta, or Little Manila Rising, you know, uh, the uh, Sacramento Regional Coalition to End Homelessness. I mean, I just did, I just conducted one of our, you know, interviews with, with um, Bob Erlenbush. And, you know, when you start, when they start talking about the issues related to homelessness, every single one of those is an environmental justice issue. I mean, uh, it, you know, uh, water quality, water, water quality, quantity, you know, being able to get to sanitation, you know, housing, having cooling centers in the winter when it's getting really hot. Um, Things like that. So it, it kind of it, it's a lot of different issues that are addressed um, under environmental justice. I'm not okay. sure if that is very clear. No, I, I wasn't clear enough on my question. I did, what I was interested in mm -hmm. in the Delta itself. What are the groups that are impacted? And uh, if you could provide some idea of their relative size. You know, I don't have that data right in front of me. I mean, I think we have done that. I know we've looked, especially for our Delta ADAPTS initiative and the outreach we've been doing, we've looked at Cal EnviroScreen, which is the Cal EPA's um, database that kind of helps gauge um, that type of data. Um, and so we, I think we do have that. I just honestly don't have that right in front of me, like the numbers and 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 all that. But, um, but that is something that I know we've done that work and we've done that research again for the Delta ADAPTS initiative. And it'll be something that we'll definitely be addressing in the issue paper. Um, because it's really it's important for the context as to why we're we're even working on this. Yeah, it, it's really the scope of the yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, Tanya. Yeah, thanks, Amanda, for sharing um, this update. I think it's uh, really important that the council and the Delta Science Program are are paying attention to environmental justice issues and really putting a lot of energy and, and resources into this issue paper and, and bringing stakeholders together. And, and it sounds like this will be really informative work. So, you know, my, my only suggestion at this point is to, as you're thinking about, you know, how these ideas come together and the issue paper is just keep in mind not to, um, not to isolate environmental justice as its own kind of separate thing that we analyze, but, but think through ways to infuse an environmental justice lens into a lot of the um, activities that the council does and um, you know how how these, these these environmental justice issues arise you know raises just important questions about equity and recourse for past injustices and um, a lot of important kind of management and policy questions that will be sparked by this so i look forward to seeing seeing more and if there are you know, things that the ISB can inform in this process, um, you know, reach out. 
Great, thank you. I know I really appreciate that comment and that's something that we've been talking about a lot lately and really making sure that we're making the connections we need to with other initiatives, both within and outside the, the Delta Stewardship Council. You know, internally we've got our Delta ADAPTS initiative and so really making sure that we're making those correct connections. Um, but then also, you know, one of the things we need to be doing is kind of crosswalking the Delta plan with, with all the EJ issues that we're identifying and really kind of seeing where, where do we need to be, you know, where, where are there gaps? And so doing a bit of a gap analysis like that. So that's another, another analysis that we will be doing throughout this process as well. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. See Bob's hands up again. Uh, Amanda, I have one more question. Uh, um, I realize it's early in the process and you haven't come up with recommendations yet, but uh, at the same time, it's important to think about how any recommendations might become actionable actually make a difference. And uh, I was wondering if the group has begun to discuss that. And if so, what are some of the approaches that you're considering? Yeah, I mean, we, we have started thinking about that. Um, you know, we're really trying to kind of hold off on specific, specific recommendations um, until we just are able to kind of, you know, we have our list of comments, as I mentioned, that we gathered last year, and now really trying to ground truth it with through the interviews. Um, but I think in terms of just process and kind of how I know I'm starting to think about how we present recommendations. I mean, I think there's there's certainly the recommendations that are going to be focused on what we as a council can actually address, like what is actually within our control. And then there are things that kind of affect the greater delta that we might still want to talk about because it's important in terms of just the greater context. And then I think also thinking about, OK, what are some things we can do in the short term? What are some things we can do kind of mid range? And then what are some things that are going to really take kind of longer term effort? Um, and so that's kind of how I'm starting to kind of organize um, the, the, the recommendations, so. Well, it's good. Uh, at least it's, it sounds like you're beginning to develop a, a workable strategy. And uh, in the end, that becomes vital to, you know, the, the process that you're involved in, as you know. Great, thank you. Okay, Joe. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering, is there any, any metric you are using to find these disadvantages, the disadvantaged communities in handling this type of issues? I remember when I was my Phoenix days, there were some issues, noise pollution came with them, uh, native Indian communities, because the freeway, they were putting a freeway and then the noise was basically, you know, around the freeway. But then what happened was at night, because of certain scientific reasons, the refraction of uh, noise basically went up to two kilometers away. And then the Indian community was getting you know, seriously affected. Um, and also then you have issues like pollution transport. You, know, you just generate pollution uh, downtown Phoenix area and the industry. And then it's been transported. As it transports, it converts to ozone. So 40 kilometers away, you have communities getting affected seriously by the ozone. So how, what kind of metric uh, you are planning to use? Or is there any metric like that? Uh, no, I appreciate that question. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, in terms of, as I mentioned, I know in terms of identifying communities and maybe initial metrics, I think we are, and again, I'm thinking back to our, our Delta ADAPTS work, um, you know, using Cal and Viro screen, um, which I think takes a lot of that into consideration. Um, when trying to identify disadvantaged communities and 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 why, um, and so I think that is one kind of base of information that we're using. Um, and beyond that, I, I honestly I, I couldn't tell you at the moment kind of what we're thinking about in terms of metrics. Um, um, and I know that they'll you know as we're kind of going through the literature literature review, I think we'll probably be fine tuning that and and figuring out how exactly to weave that into into the analysis and into the recommendations as well. And um, and again, how best to kind of weave that into, you know, as we're doing this crosswalk with the Delta plan, I mean, there could be opportunities there and even, you know, with performance measures and all that. So again, um, doing this, I think, gap analysis of the, of the Delta plan, looking at, you know, what we understand environmental justice issues to be and how would they affect disadvantaged communities and then crosswalking that with what the policies and the recommendations in the Delta plan are. I think that'll probably start to kind of inform how we, how we look and think about that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board members? Uh, I want to welcome Diane McKnight, our board member. And do you have any other any declarations to make, Diane? I have no declarations. Again, I apologize. Uh, 
for being late and I won't be able to stay the entire time because we're uh, working on some issues related to the Marshall fire and field work tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Amanda, you have something else? I do. Yeah. Okay. Switching hats to, to DPIC. Um, so if you go back to the presentation and um, the slide that says DPIC restoration subcommittee. So I think the next is, oh, it's the same presentation, just the next slide. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, I want to just update you all on the DPIC restoration subcommittee. Um, as a reminder, um, the creation of the subcommittee is one of the recommendations in the draft amendment to chapter four of the Delta plan. And the purpose of the subcommittee is to identify and implement strategies for reducing barriers to large to landscape scale restoration and increase estuary wide restoration coordination. And I know I've, I've spoken with you all are, about this a couple of times. Um, next slide, please. So the subcommittee held its first meeting on January 31st. Um, we had a really great turnout with wide representation from DPIC agencies, including um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, US EPA, uh, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps, Delta Conservancy, who are partnering on, on this project with, um, State Water Board, um, NOAA, uh, California Natural Resources Agency. We had Jennifer Norris, who's the um, Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity in attendance, um, the Delta Protection Commission, the Flood Board, and then also um, the tribal representation from the Buena Vista Rancheria as well. So we were very happy with the, with the turnout that we had and the engagement. Um, so our plan moving forward, well, for this first meeting, um, we, um, you know, we had a presentation from um, Council and Envi Senior Environmental Scientist Dylan Chapel, who discussed his efforts um, to identify existing projects and gaps in restoration and then the tools we can use to support this research. And then we also had a brainstorming session to help us start to craft a vision statement for the subcommittee and an initial set of goals. Um, so following this brainstorming session, we formed um, a, a work group was created to, um, to really start doing the drafting of this vision and these goal statements. And this, this work group will be meeting um, later this month um, with the plan to take something back to the full subcommittee, which is meeting again on March 14th. Um, and then the plan is to, to present to DPIC at Mar in, on uh, March 28th as well. So, and I don't know if you're interested, but if you wanna go to the next slide, um, I thought I'd just kind of very quickly kind of show you kind of some of the responses we got through the brainstorming session that we had. Um, and so we asked three questions. Um, and again, this was all designed not to really start doing the actual crafting because there's just too many people there to do that, um, but to just kind of start getting some keywords and just get, kind of get everyone's thoughts and juices flowing around um, so that we could then craft a vision statement and an initial set of goals. And so the first question we asked was, you know, what are the qualities and characteristics of a restored Delta? And so we had a lot of um, uh, really interesting, res uh, helpful responses. Um, resilience was mentioned a couple of times, um, some uh, system that's self-sustaining, diverse habitat diversity, um, you know, a Delta that's valued by its community for the varied services it provides, uh, that provides multi-purpose benefits. Um, and so, um, you know, public access for humans as well. And then if you want to move to the next slide, we also asked um, what additional restoration planning is needed in the Delta. Um, and, and more specifically, we asked at what scales um, and at what locations in the Delta. And then also what tools can we use to aid in the planning process? And so in terms of scale and locations, um, you know, there was definitely interest in, in trying to pursue more large scale landscape scale restoration projects, but also identifying that sometimes they're just opportunities that we also need to to, um, to be pursuing. Um, and then in terms of tools, um, the Delta Landscape Scenario Planning Tool, um, ecological models, um, uh, um, and just also just better, better collaboration and coordination. So identifying what tools that will just kind of increase our outreach um, to community members and to our other agencies doing restoration so that we all know what we're doing um, as well. And then finally, we asked, and last slide, please. Which aspects, so we really kind of went from big picture to, to, to smaller picture to kind of really, okay, what we've got this restoration subcommittee, what should it focus on? Like what niche, what value can it really add to the restoration conversation? Um, and so a number of things here, um, identifying, way, identifying and finding ways to procure land that can be used for restoration, cutting green tape, that's always, that's always a big one. Um, uh, 
identifying where and how recreation, ag and restoration can coexist. So again, trying to look at multi-benefit, um, looking for community support. Um, so anyway, this is just kind of a, a, you know, these last three slides just kind of give you a flavor of what the, the what was on the mind of the participants from the subcommittee, <coughs> excuse me. And so now again, as I mentioned, um, a work group has been created to kind of take all this information and to draft a vision statement and a set of initial goals that we'll take back to the full subcommittee um, uh, in, in mid-March. And then in late March, we'll take it to DPIC and ask for their endorsement. Um, so that's um, that's kind of the progress we have made. I think since uh, I spoke uh, to this, I think a month or so ago, um, happy to answer any questions on the process um, as well, if you have any. Thanks, Amanda. I'm gonna start off with one sort of basic question is, you know, restoration, of course, is, as you pointed out with your uh, different colored uh, uh, stickers there, is, is huge and complex and many different goals and aspects to it and wrinkles to it. And I, I, I guess, in one sense, setting goals is sort of the, as you're talking about, is the primary function. Once you set a goal, then at least you can begin to put bounds on it what your goal is for restoration, as you know, with Eco Restore and everything else has been huge efforts on it. And so I guess one is when you set these goals, are they going to be set in such a way that you can tie a performance measure directly to it? Because you can have goals like, you know, that are very broad. We want a better system. We want to improve things and we, you know, that set directions, but they don't set performance measures to it. Is there any talk about that? Are you going to be setting performance measures with your goals? You know, we haven't thought about that explicitly for this subcommittee. I mean, I would refer back to kind of the, the, the policies and the recommendations and the performance measures related to restoration in the Delta plan. So I think that there's potential connection. There's definitely a connection there. Um, I really see, I think the goal is kind of probably kind of that are going to come out of the, our initial goals for the restoration subcommittee, I think initially are probably going to be I'm thinking kind of a bit more based on kind of better understanding kind of where we are. I mean, you know, Dylan Chapel and, and you know, his uh, Karen Capitz's unit are doing a lot of really good work to try and understand what the current restoration efforts are. Um, but then I think there's more work we need to do to identify really kind of what are the gaps. And then also what work is already going on because we know the administration and resources agency is working very diligently on cutting green tape. And so there's may not be really a lot of work even though it showed up on our list of priorities um, there really may not be a lot of value that we can add to that effort. Um, and so, I, you know, I think our initial goals are probably going to be a bit more process oriented at this point, just so that we can kind of make sure we're all on the same, in the same, we all have the same understanding. Um, and that um, we, again, are adding value to the conversation around restoration. So, I mean, at some point, yeah, I think it would be good to have us all agreeing to have the entire Delta restoration community agreeing on a specific specific benchmarks and performance measures and all that. I think that's probably a little bit further down the line for this subcommittee at this point. And, and the other caveat to that is setting goals that are that go beyond um, things like acreage uh, and more towards functional mm -hmm. goals and, um, and that process. And once this is all done and you make these recommendations to DPIC, what's the next step? Do you expect all of these agencies via DPIC to agree to... Uh, uh, to agree to something? We'd like to. I mean, you know, honestly, one of the things we kind of keep coming back to, I don't know if you all remember several years ago when, you know, Eco Restore got started and the resources agency hired, I think it was David Okita to kind of be the restoration, the person really in charge of restoration and really moving Eco Restore projects forward. And they made so much progress and Eco Restore is still making progress, but we've identified, we realized that we still need someone like that. That's really kind of focused fully on restoration in the Delta. And it's still so scattered that we really, there is a collaborative uh, coordination effort that piece that's still kind of missing. And I, I, my hope is that with this restoration subcommittee, that's going to help us get closer to actually doing that. Um, and, you know, my grand vision for this is that, yeah, we're able to hire someone that's actually able to, to work on this and to keep us all focused on a common vision and working toward a shared set of goals long term. And so, yeah, my hope is that eventually DPIC will be able to kind of endorse that and will have most more importantly, the capacity to actually make that happen, which means we're going to need resources, we're going to need financial and staff resources to actually make that happen. Okay, good. Thanks. I see Bob and then Joe, are you still, is your hand still up or? Bob, go ahead. 
Uh, thanks for the overview, Amanda. Um, this project or your activity seems to me on the surface anyway, to be very similar to what uh, the San Francisco Estuarine Institute did several years ago. And I was wondering, uh, well, first of all, you know, are they similar? Uh, because they produced some really excellent reports, I think around 2018, 2019. And uh, if they are similar, how closely involved is uh, the Institute with this process? You know, I just put, a, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, did I, was that all? Go ahead. Okay, you know, I actually just put on my to-do list to, to reach out to Letitia Grenier and to just update her on where we are with this process, um, especially after listening to her speak a couple of times at last week's um, restoration um, symposium that the science program hosted. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely, you know, the work that they did a few years ago was just phenomenal, and, and I think it's, it's been, it was definitely something that was used as we were, were starting, as the, as the, our planning staff was developing, and our, and our science staff was developing the the um, chapter four amendment. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is definitely, uh, you know, I've, you know, we've spoken with SFEI here and there about kind of this process, but um, yeah, I actually just, just put on my to-do list to reach out to Letitia and let her know what we're doing and to see how there might potentially be some synergies there. No, I think it would be very valuable, especially if you can provide some significant value added, you know, through the process. And at least from your presentation today, I'm not sure that I see the value added part yet. <laughs> But I would think in discussions with them that you put your heads together, uh, you could really come up with something that uh, could be significantly, uh, uh, well, could provide significant value in both the short term and the long term uh, for the Delta. So anyway, uh, it seems like you're on the right track. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Bob. I'll just make one other comment. As you know, the, the board, uh, reviewed the science of restoration as its first review uh, 10, 10 years ago or so. And uh, just as you're moving along, if you, uh, and there's been sort of various discussions about maybe we do another uh, review on uh, some component of restoration or something like that. And, and uh, so as you're moving along, if things become obvious that there's some real need for some evaluation of the science of restoration or where the science is going or what would be of value just to keep us in the loop on that because that's a, an ongoing discussion with us so great thanks Steve. okay any other reports from the council any other questions from the board to the council well thank you very much uh, any public comment on this edmund Steve, could I could I just offer some more information? Sure. On um, so that the Delta Stewardship Council actually funded uh, part of the development of the Delta Landscape Scenario Planning Tool that that Dr. Letitia Grenier and her team did a did a, just a fabulous job creating. And if you want to see a a short uh, brown bag overview of the Delta Landscape Scenario Planning Tool, um, visit the website for the California Water Data Consortium. Uh, I sit on the steering committee of that consortium and, and Letitia uh, gave uh, a talk in October, great overview of the Delta Planning Tool. And um, in working with the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy on that tool, uh, we, we are planning uh, to encourage use of this very useful, broad scenario planning tool. It, it, it's, a, it's a really good tool. So if you get a chance, uh, take a look at that overview. And that's Thanks. it for... Thanks, Susan. Yeah, I think there was also a presentation on that at the February 2nd and 3rd uh, uh, climate conference as well. That yes, we... that's, yeah, just... Yeah. Thanks, Steve, I had forgotten, yeah. And, and I... Really sure that the Dr. Grenier is she is seeking uh, feedback, input, suggestions on um, broadening or improving the tool. Okay, Edmund, any public comments on this? Yeah, we have one from Deirdre Daydrodan. Deirdre, you have the ability to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation before providing your public comment. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Deirdre. Deja Dion with California Water Research. Um, 
I was very happy to see the presentation to the WISB on the EJ paper. And I thought the questions uh, by the DISB were very, was very helpful. Um, I just wanted to point out um, there was an issue with the Delta conveyance design outreach process. Um, Barbara Berrigan Perea was the contact for the EJ community and the Delta. She did an excellent job with the EJ community in Stockton, but in part because of the pandemic, she didn't talk with uh, the Latino community leaders in the North Delta. Um, and I will point out that she's not an uh, ethnic minority herself. Um, I, I did have a conversation with Ms. Berea about um, the North Delta minority communities on Twitter, and she did point out that they don't meet the state definition of environmental justice communities because the North Delta environment isn't degraded. Um, I'm not sure if it was as a result of this interpretation, uh, um, but the Latino leaders in the community of Hood weren't consulted or included in the outreach on the Delta conveyance planning until the end of the design process. And it was very disadvantageous for them. Um, and there were also problems with outreach to other North Delta communities, including uh, Portland, which has a large Latino population, and Clarksburg. And these folks probably don't meet the state definition of environmental justice communities, but all of the Delta legacy towns meet the IPCC definition of climate vulnerable communities, and I've advocated for them being included in Delta ADAPTS outreach. And particularly, I'm in the flood focus group, and these communities are very much at risk from flooding uh, and increased uh, frequency of river floods. Um, and I checked, there wasn't any outreach to the North Delta legacy communities in the first phase of the Delta ADAPT study. Uh, the 53 groups consulted didn't include anyone in the communities of Parksburg, Hood, or Portland, nor did it include the small business associations that are one of the primary social networks in the primary Delta. Nor did it include, say, the California Delta Alliance, which is a large activist group based in Discovery Bay. Discovery Bay isn't an EJ community. Um, they're quite wealthy. Um, but the community is very vulnerable to increased peak San Joaquin River floods and sea levels. So it's a it's, so it's a climate vulnerability community. Um, I just finally wanted to note that while California Water Research isn't an environmental justice group, we have done extensive work with climate vulnerable communities in the Delta, educating them about climate change and about impacts on their community. And we're not included, we're excluded from this effort. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your uh, comments, Deidre. Any other questions or comments from board members? Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the uh, next item, which is item number four, and that's a discussion and potential action item to accept the content of the Water Supply Reliability Estimation Review, and I believe Tom's going to lead this discussion. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give a bit brief um, summary of, of what we've done. Um, we, I think the, the last time you saw it, it was pre-comments from the um, uh, from the public, and we've addressed all of those. With, we have a big spreadsheet that lists um, what we did. So, um, if any of you are interested in details, we can uh, um, track it with that. And then um, Jay and I did quite a bit of um, rewriting and additions. And in response to the public comments, we addressed them two ways: the either um, changing the, the wording in the document itself or adding boxes to it. So um, you can almost read the report by looking at the boxes <laughs> as, as they go through the, uh, the issues. And um, so, some of the additions are, pre are pretty important ones. Like I think we do a much, uh, or at least attempt to do a better job of connecting to um, adaptive management so that it's pretty clear our 
uh, water supply reliability estimation uh, is an important thing for the, uh, the, the Delta. Um, so we cleaned it up and then uh, Lisa uh, volunteered to give it a hard read and she had quite a few comments uh, that we, um, um, I think we've accepted most of them. Uh, Bob Nyman worked with us on environmental flows. So that part of the report is um, substantially upgraded from what you saw before. Um, and let's see what else. I'm trying to think of anyone else's looked at. Oh, and uh, Tanya looked at that document cleaned up and uh, had additional comments for us. So it, it's undergone a lot of uh, eyes since uh, you saw it last. And, and I think we've done a, quite a bit of revision. There's still a issue with uh, repetition in the document and some of the sections uh, from the comments we're getting seem, seem to be a little bit too long. So the, the major step that Jay and I see right now is um, looking at the report from a, I guess you'd say a high altitude to uh, just make it a, a, a cleaner document. But um, hopefully the content is pretty much uh, uh, locked in now. And um, so, so what we're hoping is that uh, the, the, the board has had a chance to look at it and give us content approval and then Jay and I'll uh, uh, clean up the final document. D did you wanna add anything, Jay? Uh, no, uh, I, I think the, the report is uh, much better than it was before. Um, I, I'm a little disappointed that the, the document wasn't put up onto the website until I think yesterday. So I'm not sure if any of the, the commenters on the previous edition um, have had time to take a look and see if their their concerns are addressed. Um, that that to me is is the most likely reason to defer voting today. Okay, Jay, are you talking about uh, public commenters? Yes, yeah, I, I think we we've, we've pretty pretty well addressed uh, most of the, the comments from the board members. Yeah, normally we don't. I know in the monitoring case, we don't, we we do our best attempt to respond to the public comments and, but we don't then um, send it back for reaffirmation that we've I, done it, so. I, I, I'm, yeah. I, I just think it's nice for the, when we, the, the addition that we vote on uh, to see if there's any oral comments with folks that have had a chance to look at the, what we're voting on. Well, maybe in the motion, what we could do uh, pen, pending comments from the public. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's too invitational, but. <laughs> I guess it, it would be nice <laughs> to be able to sit down and just do a final cleanup of the document. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, I'll just chime in and say that I did have a chance to review how you incorporated, uh, you know, some of the public comments and my comments, and I thought that you did an excellent job and uh, were very generous in taking many of my comments, including cutting out some texts. So uh, I think uh, I think you all have been very responsive. Tanya? Yeah, I would say the same. I reviewed it over the weekend, and I, I think at a state when you had already addressed Lisa's comments and the public comments, so I think it's in really good shape. Most of my comments were fairly minor for just clarifying some things that could be stated more sharply. So I don't think the content needs to change from, from my perspective. I think it's in really good, good shape. And you guys did a great job. Any other discussion or questions from the board? Do people feel confident enough to go ahead and uh, approve the uh, content on this? So informally, I see heads nodding, so, um, you know, or thumbs up. So let's go forward with the motion. And I have a, I, I think I'm okay if I can make the motion, uh, since it's written here, uh, to uh, make a motion to approve the content of the report for submission 
of the Water Supply Reliability Review Report for submission to the Delta Stewardship Council. After the lead authors address any agreed upon changes related to content, which I don't see any, and work with staff to format for publication. Uh, any edits to the report would not change the intent of the findings and recommendations. Jay. I would like to add one modification. That sure. A couple of us talked about earlier. I, I would like to add a, a recommendation that uh, we request that the um, Delta Science Program staff coordinate with the affected agencies in this area to develop a memo to us about how the agencies are thinking about responding to this report. We, we have talked about adding that in, in, as a, a general item to all of our, all or most of our reports from now on. And I so, thought, well, well, maybe we should do it now. Well, let me, let me clarify what you're suggesting. Um, are you suggesting that that language be in, uh, added to the report, or are you suggesting yes. that after the report is done, we can make that as a specific memo? Well, that's that's a either way is perfectly reasonable to me. Um, maybe this could be in the cover letter. I, I from our earlier meeting, I, I jotted down some wording that I, I'm just reminded of. Uh, the Delta Independent Science Board requests that the agencies involved in this topic, and we might want to list them, uh, provide a combined written response uh, to this review's recommendations within six months of this review's publication, coordinated by the Delta Stewardship Council's Delta Science Program. I can okay. put that in the chat, I suppose. Yeah, to me, it seems like that's more of a... Uh... It could be a cover letter. Cover letter, uh, Lisa. Well, I was actually going to bring up a slightly different issue. So, if you want to round this out, but yeah, I, I think that could be put into the transmittal letter and become part of our uh, cultural norm of our board that that we always expect a response uh, would be better than putting it in the report. Yeah. So, Jay, then are you review? Are you with, withdrawing your modification to I my, withdraw my motion? My hasty modification. I, we, we found that a better. Better means to do it. So, so is there, I, what, first, I need a second of the motion, then we can well, have a discussion. Actually, I have a co the comment I wanted to make was the Roberts rules that I'm familiar with do not allow the chair to make a motion. So I want to make I want to get a process oh. process check. <laughs> I don't know. My name is in my notes that I got. <laughs> my name <laughs> is there. So <laughs> would anyone like to make a motion? I move that we accept the water supply reliability report for. Or approve the content of it, I, subject to some minor edits. A second. Okay, now we can have a discussion. And I, I, I withdraw my uh, motion that I made, obviously, for, because of I violated some law. Um, but uh, <laughs> all right, let's have a. Uh, uh, I guess we open it for a discussion, and then we uh, have public comments, and then we can take a roll call vote. So, any uh, further discussion on this? Okay, not seeing any. Is there any uh, public comments on this, Edmund? Yes, we have one from Deirdre de Jardin. Um, Deirdre, you have given the ability to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation before providing the public comments. Thank you. It's uh, Deirdre de Jardin with California Water Research. Um, and I did work with um, some of the uh, um, environmental group stakeholders and fishing group stakeholders, the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, California Water Impact Network, which works on public trust issues with California water and Aqua Alliance, which works with um, issues in the Sacramento Valley with public trust. And um, just felt that um, the authors did an incredible job of revising uh, that revising a report to incorporate uh, the concerns um, we expressed in our comment letter. Um, and I think it's become a fitting capstone to uh, Dr. Lund's tenure on 
this Delta Independent Science Board. And um, he's one of the preeminent experts in water resource management. Um, so it's really good that um, I think that you delayed this to take advantage of his expertise. Um, I did want to say though that uh, at the California Water and Environmental Modeling Forum, um, somebody uh, commented that, that the report needed more graphics and Dr. Lund stated that that would be an opportunity to festoon the report with XKCD cartoons. So I looked for XKCD cartoons and I did not see a single one. And so in order not to have false advertising, I would suggest putting one in. Um, on, a more, on a more serious note, um, I think the review is important, um, but I would suggest not requiring it to be a combined review because my general uh, um, experience has been it, it, that each individual agency should comment. My general impression is that in any thing, five agency process, the department, of, which is Department of Water Resources, uh, Bureau of Reclamation, and the three fish agencies, NIMS, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, it's, it's DWR and reclamation that dominate. And um, I think having an opportunity, I think the fish agencies are trustee agencies and as such may have different views. You know, the mission of DWR and the Bureau is really driven by their contracts. Um, so it, it, there are different missions of, of the different agencies, and I think they might not have a unified voice on um, water supply reliability. So that's just a suggestion. Uh, thanks very much, Deidre. I think we will uh, want to take up sort of following from your comment and Jay's uh, uh, recommended memo up after we vote and talk about the next steps. Uh, I also don't know that putting a cartoon in would change content, knowing Jay's cartoons. So um, uh, any other uh, discussion on this before we call a vote? Okay, I'm gonna call a vote by roll call vote. Just say, uh, Yes or no, whether you approve the uh, motion, uh, Virginia? Yes. Uh, Joe? Yes. Tom? Yes. Tanya? Yes. Jay? Yes. Diane? Yes. Um, Bob? Yes. Lisa? Yes. And Steve is yes. So uh, motion passes. So Jay, I wanna take up your suggestion. Uh, and, a broad, and maybe suggest we put this on uh, an agenda item for our next meeting. And it gets back to a couple of things, and I, I don't think I'm going off topic, um, but we had talked about uh, A, revising our guidance, and, uh, and B, talking about being, uh, following up on Lauren Hastings' report, uh, more um, direct at looking at, uh, uh, the impact of our talking to agencies more specifically so that we can uh, track and our impact on recommendations and follow up on recommendations. And one way to do that, of course, is to do exactly what Jay is suggesting is asking those agencies to, that where the uh, recommendations in essence are targeted to report back to us on actions or steps they've taken to um, uh, uh, have a look at, respond to, or incorporate their, our recommendations. And uh, so I suggest we take that up specifically related to the water supply reliability and putting a memo together as Jay suggested, but also as a little bit of a broader topic and seeing if this is something we might wanna institute more, uh, more directly and what form that might take and how that might be done and, and so forth. Does that seem a reasonable way to go? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it could be part of the the briefing process of the agencies, um, you know, and 
I could see a, 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 a briefing uh, would, that would include a request that they follow up with comment. Uh, Okay, well, I'll suggest that uh, Lisa and Jay and I get together and, and uh, uh, maybe outline a few things that might make sense, a couple of different directions, sort of following up on what Tom said as well. And, and we'll put that uh, for discussion at our next meeting, Jay. Yeah, just to give some thoughts on this, I think we really need to be a little bit more outgoing uh, as a board and connect a little bit more with the agencies and the stakeholders even a bit um, in the course of our general orders of business. Uh, and, and so having a little bit more formal follow-up to our reports, I think is one aspect of that. And I think it's, it's worth, particularly to, because we have this big changeover in the board, I think it's worth having, having us look at, our, at revising our operating guidelines. Uh, first of all, for you all to know they exist and what they, they contain, but to take the opportunity to, to be a little bit more forward looking and proactive um, it, in what we think we want to do uh, and how we want to do it. So I think that'll be a very useful discussion for the, for the future. Okay, that sounds good. We'll put it on our uh, agenda for our um, March meeting. Steve, uh, this sort of jumps ahead. Um, when I was working on uh, our first conversation about the um, subsidence review, uh, I went back and looked at Lauren's report and the stakeholders, getting the stakeholders more involved was one of the clear recommendations. And uh, we, at our meeting, talked, talked about starting with the stakeholders, you know, even before we have a uh, prospectus, just to get their um, input into um, what kind of direction would be most beneficial. So that I think the stakeholder issue is something that is, is broader than just, you know, the final product. It, it should be in the process from the beginning. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Tom. And I think that, you know, we had uh, back a handful of years ago, we decided to do the prospectus, which we did not do prior to that as a way of saying, here's what we think we're going to do and seeking public comment and stakeholder engagement on that step. And then before we started the actual review, the other thing that we've uh, done is, of course, surveys and, and retreats and so forth, where we invited folks in, in terms of what should be we be reviewing? But I think Tom, what you're saying is sort of falls in between that. Is sort of we want to do something on topic A, and before we write the prospectus, we then seek you know what should we do on topic A kind of thing. Is that sort of what you're thinking about? Yeah, yeah. At least get their perspective. In, in the end, we're going to be looking at the science behind the issues that they're raising, but. Uh let the stakeholders tell us what they're trying to do and what their concerns are and what their needs are. And I presume that would come with some sort of guidance in terms of the bounds that we're thinking about or um, what we're seeking from them. So we're, we're all uh, us scientists in this group. We're not uh, policy folks. And uh, th these are the people that are dealing with, you know, where the rubber meets the road and, so at least getting their perspective, I think, would uh, be helpful to me as I, as I try to wrap my head around what it is I'm actually going to do in a particular uh, review. Okay. When we decided to have a prospectus, um, one of the reasons for doing it was to you know, basically provide a public flag that we're thinking of doing a review on this subject and, and basically give it make it an equal opportunity of all the stakeholders to come either talk to us individually or talk to individuals on the on the board or to, to make public presentations and affirmations on, on the topic. Uh, and, and I think that's really very important and very useful. Um, that if people have a right to know what we're doing on, on the big reviews at least. Um, and 
I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to have too much pre um, prospectus process involved in this because I, I just think that that's just too much insider baseball. But but I'm, I'm I think it's great for us to talk to people informally before we have a prospectus re released. Okay, Joe. Yeah, and in, in addition, I think uh, we certainly have to find ways or think about ways which we can uh, kind of integrate or, or interact with the agencies. Some of the agencies have been very good in all our reviews. They try, you know, their best to participate, but some of that organic <laughs> connection always is the is the issue because they are so busy. People, everybody is so busy. So somehow there is, there is a way that we can organically get connected so they will have much more much more input and also receptiveness to these reports uh, that they put extra effort to, to somehow the, digest these things and put into their, their action. So maybe we might want to think about some, some methods to, to improve uh, that type of connection. And perhaps our postdocs might be able to help along this line as well. Okay, I think we're done with this topic. Um, and we're gonna, Eve? we're, yes. It looks like we may have another public comment on this agenda item, but I just wanna double check. Um, it's with Deirdre, Deirdre Dan. Okay. Uh, Deirdre, was it? another public comment you have for this agenda uh, item? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, um, I just wanted to say, um, I'd really like for the Delta Independent Science Board to follow up with some of the stakeholder, extensive stakeholder outreach I did about what the Delta Independent Science Board is and, you know, and what they do and its importance. And I think having you know, look closely and thought about it. I think you would benefit greatly from um, some dialogue with people who are where the rubber hits the road on policy. Um, and, uh, you know, I've thought a lot about my own work, which is very much in that nexus. And I think with climate adaptation um, and the challenges we're facing, I think it's, it's becoming more critical um, to have those kind of connections between the science and the folks who are on the ground facing all of these impacts of climate change. Thank you. Well, thanks for that. Yes, we, I, I think uh, we've heard the message from the Lauren Hastings report in terms of our outreach. And it's something which has really been part of the board's discussions all along. And uh, I think we are, uh, looking at our guidelines to see if we can do something more formally. I know we're inviting specific agencies, as we'll talk about later in March, to talk specifically about policies related to fish and water. And we're getting presentations on those. And we've also uh, used our field trips to get in the field and talk directly to individual stakeholders as another sort of other end of the spectrum in a sense. So uh, we continually will seek uh, sort of ideas on how we might improve that whole process. So uh, welcome ideas. Any other thoughts before we uh, move Steve, on? Steve, I'd just like to make another observation. The, the early stakeholder involvement doesn't have to be that formal a process. Uh, what we were visualizing with the subsidence review was identifying a few key individuals and just sitting down for a, a conversation with them about uh, their perspective on the problem that we're, we're thinking of reviewing. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point, Tom. I think that what, as we've done these reviews in the past, we know the process of how we do the review is varied and is varied because the topic sometimes are, requires a different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether it's the workshop sort of a format or, or interviews and so forth. And I think the same is very true in terms of the outreach on both ends of the scale and throughout the process that it will, there's no one answer. And I think that there's many ways to approach it. And oftentimes the topic you're looking at helps uh, guide you along a most productive path. So, yeah. Okay, I think we're done with this topic. And uh, we're a little ahead of schedule. So I'm gonna, is uh, Laurel, are you online? 
Laura Larson. I am online, Steve, but I had uh, stepped away from my computer, so I would prefer to go later, please. <laughs> okay, so um, let's move. Can we talk about the Delta conveyance thing next? I'm looking at Edmund and see if it's all right to move that one up on the agenda. As the chair, you can move around the agenda items. Um, so you want to go with that one next, the Plug and Vance project work plan? Well, um, actually, I think the one that we could probably finish, even though we have an hour schedule for it, is the uh, item number seven. Steve, um, oh. if you wanted to, to take a five minute break, I will be at my computer in five minutes. I'm just out walking the dog. <laughs> Ha! You can't talk from walking the dog? Uh, so slides. I'd like um, my notes, preferably. <laughs> well, we have about 30 minutes, so let's let's go to the Delta Conveyance one, number six, because that is scheduled for 30 minutes, and uh, see if we can get that done in our 30-minute uh, plan. Uh, so that's item number six. Uh, Edmund, if you could put the slides up. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we really need to do much on this particular item. And we put it on the agenda to sort of keep us thinking about this um, uh, review we've more or less committed to do starting in May or June, but we're a little ahead of schedule. And the idea is, in other words, we don't have the exact <clears throat> outline of what's gonna be in that. We don't have the content of what's in there. and. Um, Certainly, we don't have any any uh, additional guidance from the council or, or anything. So it's more or less to uh, get particularly the newer board members sort of thinking about setting aside this uh, time to do this review and also thinking about what we've done in the past so you can get some flavor of what's uh, what might be coming down the road. And that's about all. I don't think we can get much further until we start seeing our uh, what's in line for us. But I just wanted to talk about what we've done in the past, and I know you've seen it in various uh, emails and so forth, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a uh, flavor for this. Now, in the past, there were a series of, um, I guess I can go to the, to the next slide. Um, we've done three reviews on the EIR, uh, EIS uh, Bay Delta Conservation Plan or its uh, follow-ups. The BDCP, the first one, was the largest and really, and, and I'm going to put this in my own words and don't quote me, and, uh, uh, but this was really uh, two operations. One was to build a couple of tunnels, and I'm really simplifying this, at the same time to do a uh, restoration Play and, I th and it was some large uh, 30,000 acres of restoration. And we reviewed that. It was an extremely long document. And uh, we wrote a very lengthy review on that back in, uh, in 2014 or so. The, um, as a follow-up to that, the uh, overall planning stage uh, was split and the restoration aspect of it was taken out and it largely became a um uh it was recast as california water fix which was really focused on the uh construction and operation of the proposed uh, water export plan intakes so we reviewed a, an earlier version of that and then a um more uh final eir eis version of that and that was done in 2015 and 2017. so um now, if we go through on the next slide, just to give you some idea of our, uh, this is the first major review we did in the next slide. This is the, our table of contents. And uh, we took it, uh, it was a large document that had many, many chapters, which we'll look at. But we looked at uh, our major concerns. Remember, our, our focus on these was looking at the science of the environmental impact statement. We weren't talking about whether or not there should be tunnels, whether or not there should be a restoration program. We talked about here's what was stated they were going to do. 
here's the science of the environmental impact. And our focus of our review was on the adequacy of the science, the description and clarity of the science and, and the rationale, all, all related to the science component of it. We talked about the, uh, the, the strengths and major concerns. And then uh, again, improvements in the scientific framework of the BDCP and also uh, uh, what would, we looked at the document itself and could the document be improved in a way that would really enhance people's understanding of what was going on. We also had a series of appendices and the appendices covered each of the major chapters that we reviewed in that document. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. The next uh, slide is the more of the uh, water fix review. Next slide. And uh, this is our uh, table of contents for that document, uh, which was only 21 pages long. But again, we talked about adaptive management in relation to this. Uh, all of these things that you can see, see here, as well as prior concerns and whether the recommendations we had made in the original BDCP were incorporated into this uh, uh, water fix document. Um, the uh, next slide and the next slide. And then this is our final uh, review, our review of the final EIR related to this. So we did focus in on some particular uh, components that we felt needed special atten attention. And the next slide, which I hopefully is readable. I don't know, you should have a, all have a, a copy of this. And um, which I'm trying to find, this is a list of the chapters in the BDCP. And I think, uh, and there were chapters on things like water quality, soils, fish and aquatic resources, uh, socioeconomics and so forth. And we reviewed where there's an X, we reviewed each of those chapters and the, the comments on the review of the individual chapters, if there were things in individual chapters that rose to the level of something that would be important for the major report, it was included in the major concerns. Otherwise there were specific scientific reviews of each of those chapters, which we listed as appendices. I think we've had the, um, uh, water resources people look at this chapter and they thought that there would also be um, some new possible chap topics. The tribal cultural resources was one and community benefits program analysis, which are likely to be new components. We don't know for sure whether all these kinds of chapters will be in the current EIR. We don't know really what the table of contents would be, but we will get that. What we have now is that um, it very likely may include these. I think sea flood protection is another new one with these three new topics that'll probably be considered in the EIR. So one thing we need to think about as, as we move forward is uh, how we're going to review this. Do What we did in the past is each of these chapters, we had, I believe, at least one lead author and a secondary author. Uh, so the fish stuff, I did the fish stuff, so related, related to the uh, uh, your area of expertise, but also um, uh, have more than one people person on it and, and anybody could review any chapter. But we did assign lead authors for each, or lead reviewers for each of these chapters. Um, and then some that took on the whole, the whole thing as a whole in terms of clarity and so forth. So I, Jay, do you have anything else to add? I think you were involved in all of this. Um, yeah, it's, it's a massive document. It's broken up into chapters. We um, had, I think, at least two people, usually one, usually two, uh, review the major chapters, um, write little reviews of each chapter, which we put in the appendix of the, of the first review. Um, and I think by the third review, we, we we uh, decided that we needed to write a shorter um, primary document that would be more widely read. 
and, and so I think the, the final review had the best document, but I think for this, it'll be substantially new enough that we'll probably, and the, and the board members are substantially new enough that it's probably worth uh, tremendous extra trouble to, to actually review each of the chapters separately um, and, and have those mostly be in an appendix. Yeah, and, and I might suggest that you might skim read maybe the first handful of pages on our, on our major review and, and some of these other reviews to get a flavor of the type of uh, depth, breadth, and detail we did and did not have in this because um, there's certainly uh, some balance of that that's, that's valuable. Before I go to uh, Bob, uh, Tom, were you involved in the last one? I guess, I guess he was, but he gave us a thumbs down. And, no, uh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, I think Joe I probably, think... Joe was. Yeah, I, I, I was involved. Yes. Oh, that's right, Joe. Yes, and, and I think I also did the number 24 noise. Uh, it's not crossed off here, but I think noise was evaluated too, number 24. Oh, okay. It was a mammoth document. Each person wrote one, two pages. And then it became very large. And I remember, that in, in fact, one uh, member of ISP resigned <laughs> because couldn't handle the whole thing. Probably, I don't know if you even remember. When I first came in, uh, when the, the documents came in, it was too big <laughs> for a person to handle. So he basically resigned uh, that time. But anyway, it, it, it's, it's, it's fun to do it. It's just a matter of uh, allocating your time. To, to have these large chapters. And, and it, it sounds like the 30 some thousand, I, hopefully it's not gonna be 30 some thousand pages, but I, but I think that some of the recommendations we made were to put chapter summaries and things like that. And oftentimes when, you, when in those versions, they were looking at different alternatives. So by the time you got to third, fourth, fifth, sixth alternative, there was really not much change in the, uh, in the scientific process that they use to evaluate those. Um, so, um, Bob. Um, Steve, could you remind me, um, I assume that we're being formally requested to review this. Um, who is doing the, the request to us? Is it the Delta Stewardship Council or is it the governor's office? Just how formal is it? Are the re the invitation that we will receive. The legislation that founded the Science Board has us reviewing proposal, major proposal for Delta conveyance. And that request comes from who? The legislature. It's in the law, signed in okay, 2009. It, it, the legislature then issues us a, a formal invitation to review this report. It, it is in the existing legislation that we will review this for science. Okay. okay. Well, maybe that negates my second question is that I was really wondering in terms of our recommendations, uh, just how much influence do our recommendations have on who eventually makes the decision whether or not to go ahead with this project? We, um, as Jay says, uh, the legislation required us to review BDCP, which we did, and I think our results were were used uh, in the final determination of whether or not this project was going to go forward. Our 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 not recommendations, but our evaluations, and I think that um, we did along the way get uh, before we started in each of the past three reviews. I believe we did get some council guidance and council questions in terms of what they would like to see in our review, we of course can, uh, uh, can add or subtract from that, from that guidance. But I, I, I would uh, argue that our, uh, we were probably the only independent science body reviewing this, you know, so. Okay. All right, that's good. That's what I wanted to know. I assume that there's going to be several other organizations or agencies reviewing this as well. And I kind of wondered, uh, uh, about the level of our influence, does it did it penetrate the legislature and the governor's office and so forth? And the, I guess the last time the governor vetoed 
the project is my understanding. And I was wondering, you know, how much influence we have at those levels. Lisa? Well, you want me to answer that question? No. Yeah, I was hoping you would answer. <laughs> I would suggest that's a very difficult question to answer, but you know, certainly if we're, we're part of a preponderance of views, I would imagine there's some influence, but I, 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 I doubt anyone can answer that question. Um, my point is somewhat related to Bob's. Um, you made some comments about the structure of the EIS and how there was this tendency to snow people with detail without the ability to really pull out what were the risks. And that, and that is kind of a personal uh, agenda of mine to improve EISs so that they're closer to say risk assessments or really show what the what the real potential, the magnitude and substantialness of the harm as opposed to snowing you with detail. And so my question is, is there any personnel who've been carried over from the last version who uh, would take that to heart? And can we expect a better uh, EIS this time, EIR this time, or is it, uh, is it a whole new crop of people? Uh, firstly, I never used the word snow and uh, <laughs> as a purpose. I think, the, um, I think what we heard in our last presentations and frankly in, in the, uh, in I think the, the, the later version of Water Fix that, the, that they did hear us and take some of our recommendations into account. I think the presentation we just had, um, whatever it was in January or whatever about this, that they acknowledged the recommendations we made on clarity and summary statements and things like that. So I do hope that they look at that because that will be one of the key factors that that if you look at the that are um, our table of contents one of the factors in there is how well did they listen to us the last time and that's one of the things we'll be looking at in particular is how well have they listened to us and uh, so hopefully they are listening joe yeah just to add to that uh, i remember certain major issues they also in writing they responded to them uh, so they basically took it pretty seriously. That's right. Okay, uh, Bob and Diane, do you have your hand up? No. Well, okay. I just have one last comment, really. I, I did read through the last reports uh, uh, that the DISAB uh, did on this, and I thought they were really well done. I thought they were thoughtful and... Uh, uh, very insightful about um, what sort of EIS is needed and so forth. I really learned a lot by reading them. And, and uh, I guess on a personal note, uh, you know, I was uh, heavily involved in the EIS for the Pebble Mine in Alaska. And I really wish I'd have had uh, these reports to draw on in terms of just the wording to use, you know, when we wrote our reviews uh, of the EIS for, for the Pebble Mine, because I thought, uh, the reports done on the conveyance project were uh, really quite strong in terms of getting their message across. So anyway, I liked I liked them, and it's really worthwhile reading as we prepare, you know, for the upcoming review. And and Bob, we will get be getting a presentation, I believe, hopefully by May or so, depending on when that when um, this review will be complete. And I. I think your message of how well are you paying attention to our previous um, comments on on clarity and and being on point and so forth. I think uh, we can ask them specifically in May. But I think Edmund, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't they cover that a little bit as well in our in their first presentation to us? Um, that is correct. When DWR presented in August of 2020, um, they commented on your comments on a notice of preparation, which summarized some of the key comments from your last review, and they provided a brief overview of how they're planning to address um, those comments for the upcoming EIR. Um, we could um, we, we could repost this or we could recirculate the summary. That'd be great. Thanks, Dan. It, I was wondering, is there going to be any uh, federal level uh, uh, use of our comments, our review of this EIS? Does that play in here? And this is showing my ignorance of the process. I'll say something and then Edmund can correct me. The, um, 
there's an EIS and an EIR, and I think the EIR is state and the EIS is federal. And if our comments are done within the within the time frame of the public comment period for the, I guess the EIS, then it becomes an official public comment for the federal version of this. Is that sort of okay? Close, Lisa. Am I wrong on that or okay, Edmund? Edmund? Yeah, I just want to clarify a few things that DWR mentioned at the last meeting. So for California water fix, it was a, um, they meant, you guys did like a, it was a joint environmental impact report and statement. Um, but based on the presentation that DWR gave um, last month, they indicated that um, it could be potentially two separate documents, an environmental impact report and an environmental impact statement. And the environmental impact statement could be released around the same time as the environmental impact report. Um, they clarified that um, the lead for the environmental impact statement will be the United States Army Corps of Engineers. So that's a slight difference from the last time the Delta ISB reviewed. Right. Lauren. Okay. I was just trying to get my video on. I guess you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear um, you. Yeah, my computer is not wanting to work right now. Um, so yeah, my understanding is that the EIS this year is gonna be a separate document. So that um, that may come out around the same time as the EIR. And so it would be your choice then to take a look at that document and provide a, a comment letter on that document. And we don't know as much about that one right now. But from what, thanks, Lauren, but what she said in January, it's, it's a, I don't want to say a scale down, but it's, it's a, more of a scale down version of the EIR. Yeah, it sounded like, and I'm just trying to do this from memory, maybe Edmund has a better memory, but from what uh, Carrie Buckman said, I believe they, it might be focused even on some specific things. Um, in right. the EIS, but the that the EIR, I believe, is the more extensive document. Yeah, that was my understanding. But, but the EIS will have distinct content. So there will be completely different content in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, not, not that there will be some overlap too, but there will also be distinct content. Even if it's 10% of what it was before, it'll still be a long document. So Lauren, you just said that we would review both. I believe it's your choice what you'd like to do. Um, we, we can try to learn more about the EIS. Thus far, we've just been coordinating with DWR on this, but we can try to learn more about it and better inform your discussion on that. Yeah, and, and, my, uh, and, and one thing to check out, it seems like the EIR, which is a state thing, and our legislative responsibility is by the state of California that we have a role to play, an official role to play in that process. The EIS being a federal Corps of Engineer things, our comments we make there, even though um, it might carry some weight, are would be as a member of the public. It would be a public comment. Is that correct? Yeah, what? I don't. I, I think we should try to learn more about it and get back to you on that. Yeah, we have no federal role. So that's what I mean. We, for the feds, we're just a uh, independent science board working at the state mm -hmm. level. Okay. Uh, what else do we need to uh, make sure I'm covered everything? While Steve's thinking, so, let me just ask Lauren a question. Uh, if there are other documents, I, I appreciate uh, the sharing of the past reviews. Uh, of course, this project's different, we understand that. But if there are other background documents that you think would be particularly valuable, knowing that there are likely to be certain components again, that would be um, useful if you had any of those to forward as well. Because I think we could use this time to personally get up to speed on some more of the issues so that we're better prepared to hit the ground running. I think that's a great idea. And I'd go further and say, Edmund, if you could create sort of a box for this that would not only include these reports, but also the one that Joe brought up in terms of the 
uh, their response to our review. That'd be a useful document. And any other thing that looks like a really valuable thing that we should at least skim or be aware of or have as a reference to go back to uh, would be uh, would be useful to put in that in one area. So when we're completely have nothing to do and want to go look at uh, past reviews, that's a good place to start. Sure, we one, can do that. We have one I, place. I, it, it might be helpful to learn from those of you, I guess it's the three of you at least that are still on the board, what you found um, as helpful supplemental reading. Recall, that'd be helpful to know. Okay. Sounds good. Anything else on this topic or any public, any person, anything else from board members on this? I will make a tongue in cheek recommendation that we ask for a physical copy of the report so that we can have a picture of us taken behind it. Any other comments or public comments? I'm not going to comment on Jay's motion to kill trees. But um, any other uh, board member comments or any um, public comment on this? Yeah, we have a public comment from Deirdre Degradan. Um, Deirdre, you have the ability to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation before providing your public comment. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is Deirdre Desjardins with California Water Research. And uh, I do know the answers to some of the questions posed by the board members. Um, I'll try to address some and I'll try and get a letter to you. Um, so the, the, the real nexus is that under the Delta Tunnel uh, project is required to be consistent with the Delta plan under the Delta Reform Act. Um, and to do so, it has to use best available science. And so from that point of view, the Delta Independent Science Board review is extremely important. Um, last time the project uh, was going to be remanded and instead they withdrew the application that was in late 2018. Um, the draft findings um, stated that the Department of Water Resources failed to use best available sea level science on sea level rise. Um, and in fact, in 2013, the Delta Independent Science Board had stated the potential direct effects of climate change and sea level rise on the effectiveness of the actions, including operations involving new water conveyance facilities are not adequately considered. Um, I do have a concern that um, uh, they've been, it's been reported that they're gonna try and reuse as much of the analysis from the previous BDCP water fix EIR as they can. It's partly a cost issue. It was very expensive to do all the analysis for that EIR, um, but I think they should have done they uh, redone the climate change analysis with high sea level rise sooner and released it for review. Um, another thing I'll say is the Delta Stewardship Council attorney did come in and um, and modified your operating guidelines in April of uh, in uh, May or June of 2020. Um, to declare that the legally mandated consultation, uh, which was on the BDPCP water fix project, was finished. And we have concerns that that was correlated uh, with the motion, the move by um, five attorneys outside of the Delta Stewardship Council uh, to decide that the Delta. ISB suddenly couldn't be paid anymore after 10 years of getting paid through contracts. Um, both of these was interference with the Delta ISB because it came through a back door and we have publicly requested that if there's, if there's requests from other agencies, the Delta Stewardship Council is an independent agency and they need to consider the requests, even if they're from other agency attorneys, 
through the, it needs to come through the front door. It needs to be publicly made and there needs to be comments on it. And we think this is very important both for the Stewardship Council and for the Delta Independent Science Board, which is a completely independent board of the state of California. You're not under anybody but the governor, is my understanding from the statute. Um, so thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that comment. Um, any other comments, questions from the board? Okay, we're scheduled to to uh, take a one hour break uh, at 11 o'clock uh, given people's uh, scheduling. So I think we're gonna go ahead and do that now. And uh, so we will break until uh, 12 o'clock uh, Pacific time. We'll reconvene then. Okay, so we're we're on uh, on a break now. And broadcasting. Sorry, we got the got going there and. Um, Okay, we'll give it one more minute for the rest of our board members to return. I'm sorry, I thought everybody was here, so. Okay, it's uh, 12 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, right. we are... uh, Mr. Chair, we are recording a broadcast and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, we're starting with the uh, continuing with agenda item five, which is our report uh, from the uh, Delta lead scientist, Laura. Thanks, Steve, and welcome back, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to start out my report by acknowledging our receipt of the Delta Independent Science Board's Science Action Agenda Review. Uh, we really appreciate receiving the detailed comments that you provided us with. And as for the next steps in the process, uh, we are currently revising the Science Action Agenda. Um, and one of the things that I wanna let you know that I've done is I've undertaken a complete revision of the forward in order to respond to comments of, comments related to how the different science actions fit together into a coherent science vision. And so that framing is something that I'm attempting to do with this revised forward, um, which starts out with a discussion of different types of uncertainties and how these science action agenda, uh, or how these science actions can help resolve those uncertainties and what the link <clears throat> to management in particular regulatory uh, action is. Uh, and then I get into a discussion of how the different science actions encapsulated within the science action agenda really fall under a theme of integration, uh, which is a very broad theme, but in the forward, I go through the different components of integration, particularly as it pertains to understanding the complexity of our socio-ecological system um, and really break down how the different science actions uh, help us accomplish these, this objective of integration. Um, so I, I've been personally spending a lot of time on that. And I know folks throughout the whole Delta Science program have really been taking all the public comments that were received in addition to the ISB comments very seriously and have been making extensive revisions throughout the document. Uh, we are planning on getting that document to our executive team at the Delta Stewardship Council to review it. Um, by the end of the day today. And that executive review period will take us through part of next week. And then the document goes to uh, the Office of um, Production, Government Printing, um, 
who will convert it into a format that looks nice and is accessible to the public. And then the executive team will receive it for a second review in late March after that formatting is complete. And we expect to release the final science action agenda on Earth Day, which is April 22nd. Uh, but it will be formally presented to the Delta Stewardship Council at the council meeting on April 28th. Uh, the revised document is going to uh, devote part of Appendix A to explaining how the report has changed um, and will also provide a link to all of the public comments that were received um, so that people can see the, the type of comments uh, that we got on, on the draft. Uh, so I, I just want to pause there and ask if there are any questions about our process moving forward. And again, thanks to all of you for providing us with such a detailed and helpful review. Thanks, Laurel. I have uh, two questions. One, did you get a lot of public comments? We did. Um, I think Rachel may be on and can tell me how many we received. We have a spreadsheet where we're tracking all of the public comments and it is quite large. Okay, a second question is in terms of our comments, or were you asking Rachel to? Um, I, if, if she's here, I'll, I'll just have her chat me and I'll provide that update. <laughs> okay. Uh, secondly, with respect to our specific comments, will there be any uh, like a formal response to how things were changed relative to our main concerns? Or are you going to incorporate that into the appendix or? So to some extent that will be included in, in, in the appendix. Um, we have not provided that formal response in the past, but are definitely, if it's requested by the board, I think we would be happy to come back at a future ISB meeting and walk through those responses. Hmm. Tom? See Tom. Yeah, I just have a, uh... Curiosity question. What, what happened to the co-laboratory? Is it still in there? Okay. Yes, I. this is something I actually feel pretty strongly should be in there um, because this is an effort that is very much on the radar of the Integrated Modeling Steering Committee, um, which is getting ready to hold a, a, a summit um, or a workshop a little bit later this year um, that is really focused on launching the collaboratory. So it, this is, and it's a major priority of mine moving forward as well. Um, it's probably my biggest priority to work on and, and get launched and seek external funding for in the next year. So I, I think it's important to be in there. Um, I, I do think it stands on um, several years of discussion, um, starting with Peter Goodwin uh, in, in his tenure as Delta lead scientist. So I, I think it's useful to have that call out in there. One of the things we are doing with the collaboratory though, is we're trying to do a better job of explaining what it actually is okay. and providing examples of, um, th that are relevant to the collaboratory. I, I wasn't aware of the other efforts. So that, that was why I was the same premature, but it's, yeah, it's, this has been a topic of focus for the Integrated Modeling Steering Committee for some time, and they're hoping to see real progress on it this year. Okay, good. Oh, I do see Rachel is here. Um, so Rachel, I think she has some numbers for us. Yeah, sorry, I was lost in the being pulled over into a panelist mode. Um, we had 14 individual comment letters um, submitted, and they varied. We had some from federal, uh, one federal agency, a couple of state agencies, a few collaborative groups, one nonprofit, um, one from an academic institution, um, kind of a handful of others. And um, some of them were about as long as ISB ones, like 10 or 15 pages long. And then some were, you know, short and very direct on a couple of individual comments, but I think 14 in total. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions before I move on to the next item? Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you all for this one. Um, I have an informative slide. Let me get the screen share going.
So I, I did want to provide a, a bit of a report out on the Delta Science Fellowship. Uh, we have a request for applications that is live. Uh, the Delta Science Program has launched this request for applications in collaboration with the California Sea Grant. And this will be the 13th round of our request for Delta Science Fellows. Um, these fellows will have a tenure from the 2022 to 2024 academic years. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, the Delta Science Fellowship provides support for master's students, PhD students, and postdoctoral scholars for both their research and for their academic stipend. Um, the fellowship funds research projects that advance the understanding of high priority science issues that are affecting the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And in fact, uh, their work does need to be tied directly to science actions. Um, that are in the science action agenda. And uh, for this round of fellowships, even though the 2022 to 2026 science action agenda is not yet finalized, we have provided prospective fellows with a copy of the public review draft. Uh, we are requiring prospective applicants to submit a notice of intent by February 28th. That's a required step if they want to submit a proposal um, by the application deadline of April 20th. Uh, but one of the things we will do is that once the wording of the science actions in, in this updated version of the science action agenda is finalized, uh, we will provide the people who filed a notice of intent with that version uh, so that they'll have the most up-to-date science actions. Um, so priority topics are called out in the application materials and include research in both the biophysical sciences and the social sciences. <laughs> and in fact, this year we're launching a separate panel to review the social science specific proposals. And one of the things we're asking uh, potential fellows to do is identify in their notice of intent whether they prefer to have their uh, their work reviewed by a panel of experts in biological sciences, physical sciences, geology, chemistry, or whether they have uh, whether they prefer to have their work reviewed by the panel of social scientists. Uh, the application website which is a Sea Grant website and the listserv announcement of this RFA release was, were both included as part of your meeting package. And what we can use your help with is uh, really helping us to spread the word about this opportunity. The other thing I'll note is that associated with the Delta Science Fellowship Program is a really unique and I think really strong, um, strong program of mentorship. Prospective fellows are required to identify both their research mentor, who is typically their academic advisor, but then also a community mentor. And the community mentor is somebody who uh, works in the Delta, applying science to management or policy. Um, they might be practitioners, they might be scientists who are situated within some of our state agencies. Uh, they might be decision makers, um, but this is one of the ways in which we both provide our fellows with a really unique form of mentorship, but also help connect their work to uh, priorities for management and decision making within the Delta. And we know that it can be difficult for students at the universities to know off the top of their head who would be a suitable mentor. And so one of the services that the Delta Science Program provides here is help in matching students with community mentors. So we've asked them to identify in their notice of intent whether they would like to make use of this help that we're providing. Um, but one of the other things I think you as ISB members might help us with is um, potentially recommending community mentors that could work with our students, uh, maybe based on some of the interviews that you've done for your recent review topics. Um, but please definitely help us spread the word among your students and your colleagues. Uh, in particular, in the past, we haven't seen as high 
um, a submission rate in the social sciences as we would like to see. And so we could particularly use your help in getting the word out to that community. Uh, Lauren, I see your hand is raised. Oh, maybe not. Sorry, that was an accidental hand raise. Okay. Sorry. I, My mistake. I thought maybe you had something to add because Lauren has, has really been um, leading the launch of this RFA and the collaboration with Sea Grant. Are there any questions from board members about this topic? How many uh, fellows do you support? So to some extent, that number is dependent on their <clears throat> budgets. Um, Lauren, could you chime in? Do you have numbers on how many we've supported in past years uh, class, for classes of fellows? I think it's around 12 or so. It's, is that right? well, it's, we're, we're targeting six to eight oh, okay. um, with That's our fine. budget, but in other years, we've gotten other sponsors for some of the successful applicants where perhaps we didn't have sufficient funding. So the state water contractors have funded one to two fellows in the past. And um, in conversations I've had, they are open to doing that again this year. So that can bump the number up by one to two. Thanks for that question. If there are no further questions, I will move on to the next topic, um, which is a brief report out on the Adapting Restoration for a Changing Climate Symposium. And let me go ahead and just briefly stop the screen share. Um, so as you know, the Adapting Restoration for a Changing Climate Symposium took place on February 2nd and 3rd. Uh, we had a fantastic turnout. For this, set, for this set of two days. We had 423 unique registrants for the symposium. Um, it's difficult to say how many of those registrants actually attended, but we had excellent attendance overall um, and just really rich discussions, both on the mural board that was associated with the symposium and also in, um, in, in the chat, um, as well as through verbal engagement. A few of the things that we heard from participants was that they really appreciated the diverse nature of the sessions and talks, uh, which helped connect dots between disparate parts of the system. Um, a big emphasis was the incorporation of perspectives from uh, indigenous uh, people. And that was something we heard was very appreciated among the participants. Uh, participants also identified the proactive nature of the conversations, highlighting not just the issues, but also how we could work together to solve problems. So we heard some presentations about uh, innovative ideas like the use of floating peat islands as a mechanism for um, addressing deeply subsided islands within the delta um, as kind of a stopgap measure for increasing elevation to the point at which you could actually feasibly consider doing uh, marsh restoration for carbon sequestration. Um, I did want to open up a little bit of a discussion around this because Steve Brandt and Virginia Dale, um, maybe some other members of the ISB uh, were in attendance at the, at the symposium. And I'm really curious to hear what your thoughts and opinions are on those two days. So I really liked the Native American presentations. Not only were they informative, they were so creative in the way they shared their information. Um, and I liked the landscape perspective they presented with the maps of different options and talking about the, the um, benefits and the cost to the local community as well as to the environment about those. Um, I was really glad I attended. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Virginia. I really did appreciate the uh, and, and the uh, sort of the Native American viewpoint, and and it was really uh, uh, really interesting to hear, and it was very uh, very informative. I I apologize, I missed day two, but I had realized somewhere during the conference that it was being recorded, so I realized I could go back and watch day two <laughs> some other time. Um, so I missed I missed day two. I'm I'm really. Be, uh, I think from what I saw and what I saw on the agenda and what I listened to, uh, there certainly are a lot of interesting and varied approaches to restoration, which I think was a lot of uh, and different perspectives on restoration. I'll be curious to see 
what conclusions are drawn that link it back to climate change? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and, and how you make that, what's on that arrow? One of the things that really stood out to me at the symposium was just this emphasis on the need to communicate uh, across the Bay Delta boundary and do coordination with respect to topics such as sediment management on an estuary scale. I think really the fact that we've been, I don't want to say overlooking <laughs> sediment, but perhaps the fact that sediment has not been given due consideration in the Delta as a need to really think deeply about in, in terms of planning um, the, the portfolio of restoration projects associated with Eco Restore and other initiatives and whether the sediment supply is going to be sufficient for the survival of those wetlands. I think those are topics that uh, really came up in conversation at this symposium in a major way. Um, that brought some of these issues to the forefront. And so, you know, there have been a lot of um, a, a lot of ongoing discussions about how to better coordinate our science and better coordinate our communication across this um, Bay Delta interface. Uh, you know, the the communication and coordination between the science action agenda and the estuary blueprint is another example. Um, but I think a lot of these activities are really coming to a head and I'm hoping we'll see really, uh, I'm hoping we'll see real progress in this estuary scale coordination moving forward. I'd just like to add a comment too. I attended part of the uh, workshop and I really did appreciate seeing these kind of, it was a sophisticated conversation about these restoration projects and new techniques being tested and uh, I really appreciated that. But it also made me curious about how sites are chosen and what priorities are. And, you know, so kind of back to the whole qu many questions we raised under the science action agenda, it brought mm -hmm. that back to the fore for me. So it would be nice to try and figure out if we're, if we're meeting any priorities as we choose these or how we're using experimental projects to inform the next step, I think is a key mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment. Any other thoughts on that? Well, for those of you who weren't able to attend, you should be able to access the recording online and I'll make sure that Edmund gets those links to you on how to do that as soon as they're available. The next item I wanted to move to is the topic of recruitment of the three new Delta Independent Science Board members. And just as a reminder, um, the review or, or our acceptance of, of more of additional applications has closed as of February 1st. Um, and we are in the middle of our first round of interviews. Uh, soon the recruitment committee is going to meet to discuss how the five interviews that we conducted went um, that will take place on February 17th, I believe. Uh, and then we'll also make a decision as to whether or not we want to review any of the additional two applications that we received since the first review period closed. Um, just as a reminder, the areas of expertise that we're targeting for this recruitment include water resources engineering, hydrodynamics, climate science, algal or invasive species ecology, and ecotoxicology. And we have received applications in all of those areas and are conducting interviews um, in all of those areas of expertise. Um, so I have some numbers for you for the first round of, of review. We received eight applications. And as I just said, we're moving forward with interviewing five applicants. Uh, the interviews are conducted by the a uh, search committee, which consists of Delta Science Program members and also US Geological Survey staff. Um, for the second round of review, we received two applications and review of those materials is currently underway. So in terms of the next steps, uh, the selection team does meet on the 18th. Um, we expect that should we choose to conduct additional interviews, those will wrap up by the end of February. Um, people's schedules pending. <laughs> And then we will, the next step after that will be to make a recommendation to the council um, who will make the final decision on who to appoint. Um, I do 
expect to also continue to have discussions with ISB members um, that are relevant to this decision during that period of time. So any questions on the next steps of the review process? So would you expect by March council meeting to be putting a name forward? Um, let's see. So I, I believe the earliest, so I, I think this, yes, I, I think that we, we could potentially put in this uh, recommendation as early as March, at least for the first position that we're hoping to fill. Um, I expect that it's realistic that that position uh, would be filled by June 1st, and then the two remaining positions would take effect in November. Okay, so we can assign that person to, to do the first review of the EIR. That's uh, right. <laughs> any questions from the board on that item? Okay, you got one more item. I yes, so I, I wanted, I'm going to share my screen again because I, I have a bit of a flyer to advertise a brown bag seminar series that we're planning that I think your members will be quite interested in. Let me just go ahead and share the screen again. Okay, and are you seeing the, the brown bag slide now? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. So the Delta Science Program has organized a brown bag seminar series for this spring uh, that is titled, What is Delta Governance Anyway? Uh, the Delta Governance Brown Bag Series aims to increase awareness of and engagement with the social, political, and institutional dimensions of Delta science and management. Uh, these, this three-part webinar series will feature panels uh, with speakers that represent multiple levels of government, including federal, state, and local as well as non-governmental, tribal, and academic perspectives on Delta governance. Each of these three panels will have a thematic focus on a specific social scientific governance framework. Uh, the first panel discussion is going to take place on March 1st and will focus on environmental governance. Uh, the second panel will take place on April 13th and will focus on collaborative governance. And the third panel will take place on May 5th um, and that panel will, will feature Tanya Hekela and will focus on adaptive governance. Uh, so in, in line with recent presentations and panels supporting the board's orientation to the Delta, uh, this brown bag series will provide an opportunity for board members to further orient themselves to governance processes in the Delta, as well as different actors engaging with those processes. So we strongly encourage attendance. Um, speakers are also going to be asked to discuss topics such as institutional coordination and effective collaboration, which are issues that have been raised by the Delta Independent Science Board in both the monitoring enterprise review and science needs assessment. So a meeting flyer uh, with a little bit more information about this brown bag series is included as a part of your packet. And just as a teaser, I could give you a little more information on the first uh, seminar, which is right around the corner. That one has been um, fully planned out. Um, that one's going to really highlight the structures and processes within which decision making and action for environmental management occurs. And our confirmed speakers for that one include Mark LaBelle of UC Davis, uh, Sacramento County District 5 Supervisor Don Natoli, who's also a Delta Stewardship Council member. And um, Kaylee Allen, who's assistant director with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as Carl Wilcox of uh, CDFW. So uh, any questions on that? And Tanya, thank you for agreeing to serve on the May 5th panel. Uh, thanks, Laura. I, I think this is fantastic. I have um, just two questions. One is, are the panelists going to focus on the Delta or will you be bringing in folks from other areas to talk about how they do it? That's a good question. Um, and I don't, so I, I know that the first one is going to focus on the Delta. I don't know the answer about the second two. So if there's, oh, Chelsea is, is here. Uh, Chelsea, I'll give the floor to you. 
Yes, thanks, Laura. My apologies. I'm not in a uh, in a good camera location. It was bright sun, so I'm going to stay off camera. But um, yes, that's correct. The first um, the first webinar is very focused on Delta governance. We are bringing in perspectives from outside the Delta as well. Um, most especially in the third panel on adaptive governance, we'll have a couple of um, researchers who can speak to governance processes that are adaptive to changing social and ecological conditions outside of the Delta as well to bring those insights in. Thanks, Chelsea. And, this, and the question I had is, is the, um, when you talk about environmental governance, are you uh, talking about management or are you talking about science governance as well? Will there be any discussion about science governance? We are talking about governance more broadly rather than just specifically science governance, but I think that we are inclusive of science governance within environmental governance. So um, it's a topic that uh, may come up in the presentations as well as the panel discussions afterward. And we'll also be accepting uh, questions from the audience. So if that were a topic that you wanted to bring forward, we could certainly highlight that for our panel in the discussion portion. And I'll also note that these, um, as you'll note from the time, each webinar is an hour and a half. So we're hoping to really give plenty of good time for that panel discussion and engagement with audience questions. Okay, thanks. Any question? I guess any questions on that or anything else Laura reported on? Okay, great. Laurel, do you have anything else to? I don't. I, I reached the end here, uh, but I do think we have a, a space for public comment. Okay, well, thanks very much for uh, your re thorough report. And uh, Edmund, any public comment? Yes, we have one from Deirdre Dejardin. Deirdre, you have the ability to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation before providing your public comment. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Deirdre Dejardin with uh, California Water Research. Um, I wanted to say that I've been looking at um, tribal bias as a concept and um, it's, you know, tribalism is an ineradicable part of human nature and, uh, you know, we all have social groups and, and we all, and there's all um, biases and concepts, but I, I find it particularly applicable to the Delta and water diverters um, have one set of biases. Um, you know, there's fishing communities, there's Delta communities, there's environmental communities, there's state agencies. And the thing I'm concerned about, about the Delta Science Program governance is it's very weighted towards water agencies. And, and this is one of the reasons that I think the Delta Independent Science Board input and oversight is very essential because I think that independent scientists coming in and looking at something like uh, the, um, this, the uh, science program plan will have really clear-sighted uh, knowledge of, of what needs to be done. And, you know, for this reason, I advocated at the Delta Stewardship Council for some delay in the, um, um, yeah, is it, I'm not sure, it's not the Delta Science Plan, but the, the research plan to incorporate the input of the Delta Science, Delta Independent Science Board, because I know you were defunded for most of last year. Um, Laura Larson did say that she had uh, consulted with the science board members all along, but I think there was a great deal of concern and, and the science board was obviously kind of crippled. So I really hope that the revisions will fully incorporate your input because I think it's absolutely essential. The mandate of the Delta Reform Act is that the Delta Science Program be a world-class science program. And to do that, you really have to incorporate these reviews by these by these minor scientists on the science board. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. And 
I can confirm that we are making a lot of revisions and seriously considering all of the comments that we've received. Thanks, Lowell. Yeah, and I know we talked about our, um, if there'd be a specific response to our <clears throat> review of the science action agenda or not. And uh, my inclination is to first have a look at the revision and uh, see if the, um, the comments and your appendix are sufficient to answer whether or not we feel, feel comfortable that our, that our uh, comments are well uh, taken. Um, if, or we can at that stage ask for more explicit uh, um, reporting of how our comments were accommodated after we see the final report. Okay, any other comments or things? All right, thank you, Laurel. We have uh, taken care of item six, so we're moving on to item seven, which is a discussion. I'm sorry. Um, of uh, future reviews. And um, <clears throat> if you all recall, as a background, we have talked about uh, uh, looking at various uh, types of review topics. Uh, we've discussed subsidence, reversal, environmental flows, and, and food webs, and we've applied the prior prioritization criteria. And now we're in the process at various stages of, um, of diving deeper into these topics. and. Uh, so we're going to go through each of these very briefly, or, or maybe not so briefly, to uh, uh, see where we are with these reviews. We'll start out with subsidence reversal, and uh, I believe Tom is leading that. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we started turning the crank to make the sausage. The, um, um, we had a conference call a week or so ago uh, where we, Primarily, we're trying to scope out the problem because subsidence reversal is actually a lot more than just subsidence reversal. There's uh, major efforts to just stabilize um, some lands by uh, managing water tables. And then uh, carbon sequestration could be a uh, big collateral benefit of the uh, subsidence reversal. And um, there's just a lot of pieces of science right now behind the, uh, the, the those efforts, but they're all connected since they involve organic soils. Uh, Laurel um, mentioned the um, the issue of sedimentation in the delta. That could be a big part of uh, um, particularly the subsidence reversal, since that could influence rates. Um, so anyway, we, we sort of scoped out the problem. Uh, and talked a little bit about some of the practical issues, uh, you know, like lev levee stability. So it's probably broader than we want to uh, undertake at this point. So what we're going to do is um, uh, in invite uh, three or four stakeholders uh, who are involved in in those three aspects and uh, just have a conversation with them uh, to see if we can uh, focus the uh, um, the, the the study topic a little bit little bit better, and then uh, I guess at that point we'd be reporting back to the board of what we're we're thinking about doing, and we could maybe even draft up a uh, prospectus uh, when, once we've wrapped our heads around the uh, the, the the problem. And uh, let's say Lauren and Chelsea and Allegra have all also. Uh, been involved in this. Uh, right now, it's uh, Tanya, Diane, and Lisa on the on the board that uh, are, are scratching heads over the topic. And that's where I think that's pretty much where we are. Uh, we're going to schedule. Uh, La Lauren's going to schedule a doodle poll with the uh, the stakeholders. Uh, we've already identified uh, people we want to include in that group. It, it's a relatively small group, and it'll be a very informal conversation. And that'll that'll be the next uh, step in in our march. And that's it. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Tom, I have just a question. Are you, are you still 
thinking about sort of a workshop format to do this or is that premature? Uh, we're thinking in terms of a workshop. We think it, it's amenable to that because once, once we narrow down on what the science questions are, we can focus on that. Uh, it, the problem with this topic is, is if you start including things like levy stability as, as sort of from a, um, say a science perspective, the, the, it would become, become an almost unmanageable uh, uh, problem. I mean, certainly a workshop wouldn't do it, but if, if we're focused on the organic soils themselves and the science that we need to better understand them, and uh, how to manage them, then I think a workshop would be a good way of uh, laying out the issues and um, getting the review done quickly. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? Okay, the next topic is environmental flows and uh, Bob and Joe and I are the uh, uh, writing team for this. So Bob, are you gonna report on this or? No, oh, I was not. I uh, got a note <laughs> from uh, Edmund and you were designated as the lead on this. I just can't get out of this no matter how much you do. You cannot get out of it. I'm a great team oh. player, but not the leader on this one. Uh, well, I, I am definitely not the leader on this one, but I will uh, give you an update. The um, environmental flows was raised as a, as a topic, and I think it was raised by Bob, but, I, but it was a... Uh, topic and it's, a, it's fairly broad. And so the thought was we need to do a little bit more, um, uh, get some more background information. So really that's planned for our March meeting. In the March meeting we have, uh, there's a technical team for in uh, California Environmental Flows Framework uh, that is gonna be talking in March to help orient the board on what is environmental flows, what work they're doing, the state of the science, Opportunities and challenges in California and understanding environmental flows and how a Delta ISB review or workshop could help. And we have, uh, I think, locked in Sarah Yarnell from UC Davis and Julie Zimmerman from the Nature Conservancy that will be representatives of the technical team and giving us a, um, about an uh, hour and a half kind of a panel discussion on that at our March meeting. Uh, we also we think we have confirmed an overview of the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, um, which will talk about um, uh, environmental flows or natural flows and, and what the current uh, uh, what the current plan is. The uh, that's the SWRCB's Division of Water Rights will provide that. Uh, that'll be an hour presentation and discussion. So we think after that we'll have some pretty good. Uh, baseline framework for uh, uh, diving further into this topic and see where we need to go and how we might get there. Edmund, did I miss anything on that or misinterpret anything? And I think you covered it. I think Bob also has his hands raised too. Oh, okay, Bob. Uh, Steve, I'd like to add on to that just a little bit um, in that, uh, uh, Edmund uh, sent around, or actually the, uh, the framework sent us some uh, readings to look at. And I would encourage the other board members, uh, if, they, if they haven't already been shared with you, I hope they, they will be shared before our March meeting. Uh, but the framework has just put together a special issue of frontiers in environmental science uh, that looks at environmental flows. Uh, from various places around the world, different aspects of them. Uh, I don't think everyone needs to read these in detail, but it's, it would be a good idea to glance at them and at least be aware of probably the breadth of issues uh, that are being addressed in, in, in other places as well as in the Delta. And uh, the second thing is this afternoon, Peter Moyle is going to uh, speak to us about uh, the native fishes uh, in the Delta and, you know, what they is needed to maintain the native fishes. Uh, but a lot of the report that he sent out to us for reading for today really comes down to the heart of environmental flows of, of what it's going to take to actually retain and nurture um, kind of the natural aspects of, of the Delta. 
and probably a deeper issue for us to consider um, you know, later on is this idea, uh, you know, does the, are there, uh, does the environment have a legal and right to water? What are the water rights for the environment? And uh, I think environmental flows is one step in this direction. And certainly in the US, uh, that does not get a lot of uh, consideration uh, directly, whereas in uh, other countries around the world, uh, culturally, uh, the environment ha oftentimes has water rights that are equal to human rights for water. And uh, it's something that, you know, I'm not sure we would wanna go that far, we could even go that far in our discussions, but, uh, uh, but considering, uh, you know, what the legal rights are for various aspects of the environment for water is worthy of discussions and environmental flows are right at the heart of that. So anyway, if you have a chance, you know, take a look at the readings uh, that they've sent us and uh, we can have a good, good discussion on this uh, at the March meeting. Thanks, Bob. Jay? There's um, some recent developments um, that are kind of interesting. A, a group of pretty eminent legal scholars and, and practitioners uh, last week came out with a very nice report on incremental suggestions for incremental changes to California's water right system, including environmental uh, regulations, um, mostly around adaptation to climate change. Um, I can uh, send Edmund a link to that, but some of them I think might be quite interesting from this perspective as well. Thanks, Jay. Any other comments? Okay, we always uh, can welcome another person on our team if uh, someone has has an interest. Feel free. Um, okay, the the next item uh, is on uh, food webs, and right now it's uh, Lisa and I. So we all clearly welcome others who want to be involved in food webs. Food webs is a uh, uh, a big topic, and it, and it's uh, one of those things in in some general discussions we've had about. If we do a review on this topic, we need to narrow it down and look at things like uh, climate impacts or food webs or, you know, we had a discussion of uh, food web application with respect to invasive species in our in our non native species report. So that's something to always keep in mind is food webs for what another kind of interesting uh, discussion is that even the definition of food webs, uh, oftentimes when people are talking about restoration, they're talking about enhancing food webs. Well, really, what, for for something like a, um, a a smelt, but in many respects, they're talking about enhancing product productivity of lower trophic levels, or enhancing zooplankton, or enhancing phytoplankton. They're not talking about food webs. I'm talking about food resources. So I think some clarity of definition and discussion is also of value. So uh, what we've, um, this afternoon's presentations, both presentations are related to that. One in specifically is by Andre, we'll be talking about um, application of food webs to support management of uh, Atlantic menhaden in a multi-species environment in the, in the Chesapeake, which will give an example of how food web can be uh, valuable for management purposes. And of course, Peter's talk uh, certainly will be dealing with that uh, concept as well and putting folks into perspective of what the, uh, uh, at the higher trophic levels are all about. And uh, Lisa, anything else? Oh, I, I wanna, in March also, we're gonna hear from uh, the Delta Science Program who is partnering with the, partnering with the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis to lead a collaborative uh, working group to analyze the drivers of estuarine aquatic food supply, which includes the development of a food web model. So they'll give us an update on the status of what they've been up to, uh, again, at our March meeting. Lisa? I'll hold comments for now. I'll make a few when Andre's speaking. Okay. Any comments or questions? Okay, any public comment on this item? 
Um, yeah, so we have one from Deirdre De Jardin. Um, Deirdre, you have given permission to unmute your microphone. Um, please state your name and affiliation before providing your public comment. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is Deirdre De Jardin with California Water Research. Um, the Delta Reform Act has a requirement to first determine the flows needed for the Delta. And there was an informational hearing in 2010 um, that a large number of stakeholders uh, participated in and a panel of eminent experts. And they did determine that um, for optimum uh, estuary health that the Delta would need 75% of unimpaired flows from the Sacramento River and 40%, and I, I think it was 60% of unimpaired flows from the San Joaquin River. And um, there were riot, almost riots from the water uh, diverter community over these recommendations. Um, but it, it's worth looking at. And um, the issue is that the Department of Water Resources, rec it, it, so the Delta Reform Act does require that appropriate Delta flow criteria be included in the order approving the uh, Delta tunnel. And, and particularly there's no in-stream flow criteria currently for the Sacramento River. There's only uh, Delta outflow criteria. And Department of Water Resources has advocated against having any, uh, any flow criteria when the tunnel is approved. Um, but I did work with a team of experts um, that uh, testified for uh, Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations uh, and uh, for in-stream flows needed for salmon um, and, and the needed studies be done past the proposed fish screens. So, and there also is a legal history um, that I researched and we uh, wrote recommendations on the governor's water resilience portfolio. But there's a history going back to the governor's com commission to be review water rights uh, in which was convened in the 1976-77 drought and did a report in 1978. And the recommendations on in-stream flows have not yet been implemented. But I have a, there's a brief summary of the history um, which I can provide to you. And, and I'll also get you, um, there's a brief summary of the history of the, uh, uh, of the recommendations on, um, uh, on appropriate Delta flow criteria. So, so there have been quite a few uh, legal efforts on this. And I happen to work with one of, Steve Walker, who's one of the best attorneys in the country working on public trust of criteria. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. You remind us that, you know, this topic of environmental flows or unimpaired flows or natural flows, uh, which aren't necessarily all the same, are is uh, of extreme interest to folks. And, and we did actually do a uh, one of our reviews on on flows and fishes, which was more or less a look at uh, impact of flows on individual species. And I think part of that recommendation was to develop an integrated modeling team, which I think was uh, was was taken up and done is in part to address that fish and flow uh, question. Bob? I would think, uh, first of all, thanks, Deidre, for uh, mentioning uh, those uh, reports and references and so forth. And, you know, as a new member or new person coming into the Delta, having a uh, kind of a bibliography uh, that lists all those various reports and uh, and as well as a, a list of their recommend, key recommendations would be very valuable. It would serve as a great primer for someone like myself, you know, just coming into the system. So anyway, I appreciate uh, you bringing those up and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to take a look at some of the key uh, reports 
you know, before our March meeting. Thanks. I, I wanted to say I'll follow up with this. Um, I have been dealing with uh, uh, chronic lung disease and I dealt with a bad exacerbation, which fortunately turned out not to be COVID, but it's been impacting my productivity. I promised some colleagues that I'd take care of myself first, um, which I've been doing. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are a, uh, well ahead of schedule, but our seminars, because of class schedules and so forth, are locked in at, uh, to start at uh, 2 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead and pick up a couple of the uh, last minute things on our agenda, and then we'll take a break until, uh, until 2 o'clock. The uh, first thing I can pick up is moving to item 10, which is a preparation for upcoming meetings. Our next meeting is on uh, March 10th. It is a two-day meeting again, and uh, um, I mentioned a number of the presentations which would be done. One is one has to do with the uh, uh, California Environmental Flows Framework Panel, also an overview of the Delta Water Control Panel. The other thing that we had talked about, again, again, leading from Lauren Hastings' report and and board uh, desire, is to have a look at uh, fisheries management drivers and legal mandates. And so we think we have secured now a panel on, on the um, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, endangered species and so forth. We have someone from the CDF and W, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMS to talk about uh, what are the purposes and goals of regulation, biological opinion or incidental take permit? And how is their organization expecting to achieve the goals? These are the questions we've asked them. What does each organization understand about uh, Environmental Species Act listed species that it manages? And what are the uncertainties in informing management? How are science and adaptive management part of the incidental take permit and biological opinion development and implementation? And how is the implementation of the incidental take permit and biological opinions coordinated? And how can we, the Delta ISB, help in general or with its potential review topics on environmental flows, subsidence, reversal, or food webs? So it'll also be part of the uh, March meeting as well as our regularly uh, scheduled activities. We will have that presentation by the uh, uh, NCAS folks that are dealing with, uh, with food webs. And, uh, and also a presentation by uh, Jenica on her, uh, her last official board meeting. In April, we're still planning a face-to-face -face meeting. We're more and more confident every day that we'll actually have this meeting. Uh, we're going to work out the venue. It may not be, it may be at a, at a hotel or something where we can get, uh, uh, but that's to be determined. The full day schedules are April 4th. I'm sorry, on April uh, 7th and 8th, that's a Thursday, Friday, but we thought we might have people uh, show up on fly in and travel on the Wednesday, and then the Wednesday afternoon, which would be the 6th, would be uh, small group discussions and, and in preparation for the full day meeting. On day one, April uh, 7th, would be the full day face-to-face uh, -face meeting, and on day two is uh, the field trip day so we can get out and actually uh, interact with uh, with the Delta itself as well as with the uh, uh, stakeholders in the public. And um, that's all I need to go to on further meetings. Any questions or Edmund, do you need to say anything? Um, nothing to add on my part. Any questions on any of that? I was asked earlier today how confident Am I in April? I am very confident. Of course, I was also very confident in our face-to-face -face in January. So take that with a grain of salt. So, my guess is this will be a hybrid meeting to some extent, uh, depending on what the state allows at that level. So some folks can—I uh, don't mean board members, but I mean if others want to uh, call in and participate in the daytime meeting. Any public comments on that? There are none. 
Edmund, are you, I think we can go ahead and do item 11, which is the review of the follow-up items, and then we can add to that if there's anything that comes up in the two seminars. Um, yes, that's correct. Are you ready? Um, yes. Um, so in terms of items for follow-up, um, Tanya made a disclosure today that she'll be participating in Delta Science Program's brown bag um, seminar series on Delta governance. Um, so we'll update our disclosure page with um, that update. Um, in addition, um, for um, today, the Delta Independent Science Board took action. The motion was made um, by Tanya Heikola and also with a second from Diane McKnight to approve the content of the water supply reliability report. And Jay and Tom will continue to make um, the final edits in terms of organization and to avoid repetition. Um, another follow-up item from the water supply reliability review um, is that there's, there's interest to have a discussion in March on how to move forward with next steps for just not the water supply reliability review, but also the monitoring review. And I have um, the chairship, Lisa, Steve, and Jay are going to brainstorm on ideas of how to coordinate a response um, to these um, Delta ISB reports. Um, did I capture those two items correctly? All right, um, in terms of other follow-up items um, for the Delta Conveyance um, Project Work Plan discussion, there was interest. Um, so we did have some materials today as part of the meeting package to provide background on past ISB reviews, um, but there's interest to start gathering additional information so the, or additional background materials that the ISB should review to help prep for a future review on the Delta Conveyance Project Environmental Impact Report and Statement. Um, in addition, um, in terms of additional background readings, um, Jay was gonna potentially send over a recent article um, that some legal scholars developed in terms of how um, flows are set. Um, and that would be part of your meeting package at the next meeting. And Bob also mentioned some suggested readings from our presenters in March. That was actually not part of today's package, but it will be provided to you as part of your March meeting package. Some additional follow-up items um, from the Delta Lead Scientist Report. Um, Laurel mentioned um, that the, oppor the opportunities for the Delta Science Fellowship is out, and she encourages ISB members to help get the word out about the Delta Science Fellowship if you have any ideas. Um, going back to the chair report, um, Steve, you, you did mention that if there are any specific project-related tasks that a Delta ISB postdoc could work on, um, that individual ISB members are welcome to start brainstorming with you. Um, so those are the major follow-up items. Is there anything anyone would like to add to our follow-up item list? Well, I know we've seen it before, but uh, it was mentioned that the conveyance project is supposed to be consistent with the Delta plan. And so I'm wondering if we need to be reminded where the Delta plan documentation is. Um, yes, we could, we could share um, information with you about the Delta plan consistency process. Um, and also it was covered in the summary that I mentioned earlier um, that, we'll, that we'll be including as part of the background materials. But thank you for that reminder, Lisa. Okay, great job again, Edmund. Uh, do we call for public comments on this? Um, there are no public comments for items for follow up. So, Edmund, can we move on to item 12, do you think? Um, for public comments are not on the agenda. We could do it now and also do it at the end as well, just in case there's anyone who wants to provide a public comment that was waiting towards the end. Okay. Are there any? Um, yes, there's one from Deirdre de Jardin. Deirdre, you have been given the permission to unmute. Um, please state your name and affiliation before providing your public comment. Thank you. Um, Deirdre de Jardin with California Water Research. And I'd like to provide the Independent Science Board with a copy of the draft staff findings on the consistency of the last project of the water fix project with uh, the Delta plan. Um, and I know it's been taken down off 
the Delta Stewardship Council's website. I do have a copy of a draft report, or I don't know if you would like to provide it, but I can put it up on my website. Edmund, what do you think is the best route on this? Um, let me double check on that. I believe it was still live um, on our web. It's not on the Delta Stewardship Council webpage, but I believe it's live on the covered actions webpage that people submit to. So let me double check on that and I'll get back to you. It was live at, at least um, a few months ago, last I checked. Okay, well, thanks everyone. We are going to reconvene at, uh, at two o'clock, two o'clock Pacific time. All right, uh, you are now live and the floor is yours. Well, we welcome back everyone to our meeting of our Delta Independent Science Board. We're gonna wrap up today with uh, two uh, stimulating uh, discussions on food webs and fish. And uh, to lead off, we'll uh, let uh, Lisa introduce our speakers. Thanks, Steve. Uh, well, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Andre Buchheister. And I invited Andre to talk to us because of, I know about his really interesting modeling work that he's done to inform management of Menhaden in the Atlantic Ocean. And these are important forage fish forming a key part of the fish food webs. And they're similar to the sardines and anchovies that are present in the Delta region. And what you should know about Andre, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Fisheries Biology at Cal Poly Humboldt, formerly Humboldt State University, which I didn't know about that name change. He's a quantitative fisheries ecologist with broad research interest in ecosystem-based fisheries management, structure, function, and drivers of fish communities and predator-prey interactions, not to mention more generally fish population dynamics. He received his MS and PhD at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and did his postdoc work at my institution, the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, uh, before taking the position at Humboldt in 2016. So without further ado, we're going to hear from Andre about some of this uh, work at the interface of science and policy. Thanks, Lisa. I'm going to share the screen here. Make sure I can see you all. Great, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, and yeah, it's a pl pleasure to be here uh, to, to chat with you all, even though I am in uh, Northern California, I feel like I'm still getting to know the West Coast. Um, and funny that I'll, I'll be getting to speak with you all um, about some of the work that I did on the East Coast. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, this really started as part of my postdoc uh, at the University of Maryland, and a lot of people have been involved, and it's neat to see the, the, the progress uh, of this project. And, you know, I think it's, it's a really great example of how we can take food web models and use it to advance more of an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. And it really is gonna focus in on uh, Atlantic Menhaden, which I'll, I'll kind of introduce and describe. And I hope that you all find it interesting in terms of how we can uh, try to balance competing objectives and try to quantify the trade-offs in, in management decisions. So, Traditionally, the way that fisheries have been managed is to focus on an individual species and focus just on the factors that affect that species and make management regulations, harvest regulations, just focus on that individual uh, component. Now, those traditional approaches tend to not account for broader considerations. For example, uh, ecological interactions, right? No, no fish is an island. They, interact with other species and have ripple effects within food webs. The fish themselves, as well as the environment that they find themselves in can provide other ecosystem services that are more general, um, things like 
providing habitat, commerce, recreation, tourism, energy development, et cetera. So fish are just one component uh, of the, the benefits that we get from, from our, our natural environments and resources. And they also can have interactions with other species on a technical side of how the fishery operates. So this brings in questions related to bycatch and uh, maybe harvest or unintentional catch of protected species. And this is all happening within a complex system that is ever changing. And we have things like climate change and environmental variability that, that complicate things further. And so for, for management, there is an ongoing kind of paradigm shift in trying to move more towards an ecosystem-based fisheries management approach. So moving away from that single species consideration and moving more towards these broader, more holistic ecosystem considerations. Um, and and a, certainly a, a stepping point along that direction would be to, to focus in on multiple species instead of the, the, the full ecosystem. So this is a gradient of approaches. And Atlantic Menhaden has been an example of trying to move the needle more in this ecosystem direction. And, and that's what we'll be, we'll be talking about here. So as Lisa was mentioning, Atlantic Menhaden is a really important forage fish. So it's in the Clupeid family. So like the, the herrings and shads and, and sardines, they typically are found schooling in, in, in large schools. This species is found from Florida all the way up, up to, to Maine and even into, into Canada, though the majority of the concentration tends to be more from North Carolina uh, up to Maine. As with many of these schooling forage fish, they are filter feeders and they act as a really important link between phytoplankton and zooplankton, the bottom parts of the food web, up to larger fishes that are caught recreationally, that are caught commercially. So they play this, this vi vital intermediate link. Now the species does migrate seasonally and it can live up to, to 10 years, though we tend to kind of model them up to about uh, six years and then kind of lump everything else uh, beyond that. But really critical component within the food web supporting a, a large number of, of predators ranging from, from birds as well as whales, marine mammals, uh, sharks, etc. Atlantic Menhaden also supports the largest fishery by volume on the East Coast. And you can see that on this uh, graph that we have here in the middle. These are the, the landings on the East Coast uh, through time. And, and the, the big chunk in the middle is Atlantic Menhaden. So we're talking about a, a large component of, of, of fishery catch on the East Coast is, is Menhaden. The fishery is broken up into two components. There is a reduction fishery and that accounts for about 75% of, of the landings. And we call it the reduction fishery because the fish is caught, it's cooked and ground down and reduced to its components. And fish oils are, are extracted and then the dry fish meal is also uh, uh, maintained. And then these things are sold in a variety of products uh, internationally and, and domestically. Historically, there were 25 reduction plants along the coast from Maine to Florida. And over time, due to odor abatement and contraction of the, the fish population, uh, we're now down to just one reduction plant. And as I said, that's kind of the, the main component of the fishery. But we have a, a second component, which is this bait fishery. And that accounts for about a quarter of the landings. And that has been growing in recent years. And the fish is caught whole and then sold to, uh, to other fisheries to use as bait, for example, in the lobster fishery. Now, the species is managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is an inter, uh, interstate management agency that deals with, with a variety of species that, that traverse different state boundaries uh, in the near shore uh, environment. So this kind of sets up a, a, a key trade-off where we have a, a large directed fishery for these schooling fish, uh, really valley, valuable product. And then on the other hand, we know that um, 
menhaden are just vitally important for a number of different predators, many of which have their own really valuable economic uh, fisheries, things like bluefish, which you see pictured here, striped bass and weak fish. And as I mentioned before, menhaden are also a key food item for a variety of marine mammals and uh, birds. And so given this tension, right, these trade-offs, management is trying to account for that. And one of the ways that, that we've been approaching things is to try to develop what are called ecological reference points or ERPs, which is the acronym that I'll, that I'll be using. So this moves beyond your traditional biological reference points and is the idea being that what are some quantitative reference points that we can use to account for these competing uses of the resource? Now, the management of Atlantic Manhattan has spanned decades and is quite complex as, as it is for, for, for most species. This is a really nice kind of summary graphic from a paper that we wrote in, in 2021 um, with uh, Kristen Anstead as the, as the lead. I'm just gonna highlight a couple key, key moments through time. So I will say that the, the first fishery management plan for Menhaden was established in 1981. And even at that time, the, the management plan acknowledged the ecological role that Menhaden provided, but it was formally incorporated into one of the management objectives in 2001. About 11 years later, uh, a working group was formally established with the, the stated mandate of developing an ERP, this ecological reference point to account for the ecological role that men, Menhaden play. Another key moment a few years later was a management workshop that was uh, conducted in 2005. So let's, let's talk about that a, a little bit. So there's a lot of stakeholders uh, interested in, in Atlantic Menhaden and some of the management meetings would even be pretty contentious and uh, there'd be lots of people attending with signs and uh, a lot of commotion. So there are a lot of people that are, are really passionate about managing this species. And so in 2015, they, they had a two-day workshop and brought together a bunch of um, stakeholders. These were people from the management board, uh, fishery representatives, um, representatives from different uh, NGOs, scientists were on the panel as well. Uh, and they really wanted to establish what are the objectives that we would want for, for the species, bringing all these different voices to the table. So this was a mediated workshop uh, using structured decision-making uh, approaches. And what this, this group came up with was kind of four high level fundamental objectives, which you see listed here. So number one, to sustain Menhaden, to provide for the targeted fisheries. Number two, to sustain Menhaden, to provide for predators. Three, to provide stability for all types of fisheries. So that would be the, the fisheries that focus on the, the predators of Menhaden. And then to minimize risk due to a changing environment. And they also came up with a variety of performance measures, which we're not gonna uh, focus in too much on, but what are metrics that we would need to keep track of to know whether or not we're achieving this, this broader uh, generalized goal. Now that ERP working group have been working on developing uh, different models and you can see some acronyms listed here and, and I'll, I'll mention these in, in just a moment, uh, but they range from a, a more simple single species model down to a more complex multi-species models. And as these models were being developed, they just matched up, okay, how capable are these models for achieving uh, and providing information for each of these different performance measures for each of these different goals? And so that's what's laid out in this table. If, if there's a green box with an X, that means that model is capable of addressing those concerns. And if it's in red, uh, no go there can't speak to that issue. And so you see, you know, this second objective of sustaining Menhaden to provide for predators uh, can't really be addressed using the traditional single species model. 
Uh, it's only as we start to get to these more complex models below that we can start to address those, those concerns. So this is more for reference, uh, if you're interested. Th those suite of models uh, are, are listed here and they range from simple to complex. And you can see that they differ in terms of the number of species groups that, that they account for. The most complex model, which is the one that I developed um, in collaboration with some colleagues is this, uh, this model here on the bottom, uh, this NWAX fool, and we'll, we'll talk about exactly what that is. Um, you just get a, a feeling for the range of complexity here for these different models. So back to this uh, management timeline. So there was this really that critical moment of kind of developing these ecosystem objectives. And that same year in 2015, the stock assessment committee um, conducted their stock assessment, provided their report. And in that they included this ERP roadmap. So the, the plan for how to develop these ecological reference points. Um, and that really got kind of the, helped the ball continue, continue rolling forward. In 2017, I published a paper with this full ecosystem model, which I'll uh, introduce here in just a moment. And um, it didn't get as much traction with management as we were hoping for, but it, it kind of stayed in the mix, if you will. Um, and then by 2020, after some additional models were developed that were kind of simplified from, from my big complex one, uh, the, the management board decided to adopt these some new ecological reference points that stemmed from some of these ecosystem models that we worked on. And it really was a, a pretty groundbreaking moment. To our knowledge, it's the first time that um, a food web model like this was used for tactical uh, fisheries management as opposed to kind of more strategic uh, long-term uh, vision. So let's kind of hone in a little bit on what these ecosystem models were and uh, what some of the, the strengths and weaknesses are. So the NWAX acronym stands for the Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf. And this is uh, a model that was developed using EcoPath with EcoSim. This is kind of the most common uh, fishery ecosystem modeling platform that exists with you know, hundreds of models throughout, throughout the globe. And so we developed one here for the Northwest Atlantic, and it's a single spatial domain. So it's one box, if you will, um, but it does incorporate a variety of different regions along the, the Northeast US, as well as important nursery grounds for Menhaden, as you see labeled uh, on, on the, the map here. So without getting into the details, the ecosystem model keeps track of the biomass and the connections of all of the modeled groups in the system. As, as you can imagine, they get, this gets pretty complex pretty quickly. And so the, the, the figure that you can see on the screen is a snapshot of the ecosystem in one point in time. The circles represent different species groups with the size of the bubble representing the relative biomass. And then the lines obviously um, depict the trophic interactions with the, the width of the line uh, representing the, the strength of that interaction. And I, I did highlight Menhaden here. I, I modeled them as three different uh, age classes and they're consumed by 22 of the predators. So there's a total of 61 unique trophic groups. Now, some of those are multiple age classes within the same species like we see here for Menhaden. But so Menhaden are consumed by uh, roughly a third of all of the uh, modeled groups in the system. So really important in the system. We did also include uh, eight different fishing fleets that are largely based on gear type. And the idea for these types of models is that you establish a snapshot using the best data that you have, and then you model that through time and, and fit the model to existing data. And so we had data from 1982 to 2017. So we fit the model, tweak it so that it best captures 
the historical data that we have, and then we can use that to project forward and play these kind of what if scenarios and play these games to see what would happen if we, we change management. So briefly, um, the data needs are listed here. I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, um, but it, it requires things like uh, production to biomass, uh, which is also known as total mortality, uh, consumption to biomass, just knowing what the biomass of these different groups are. This uh, ecotrophic efficiency is typically estimated from the model. So we just need to plug in three of these four uh, top parameters for each group. And then certainly things like the diet composition and catch are, are super important, as well as having data on this through time. So what we do with the model, right? We fit it, as I said, to historical data, and then we project forward. And so here's an example uh, of doing that. So what you see on this plot is the observed striped bass biomass, which are the black dots. And then the red line up until uh, 2017 is the model fit. And then we project out into the future. And we've projected it uh, using a variety of different fishing mortality rates. So the rate at which we're harvesting menhaden. And so if we harvest at a really high rate, which would be the red colors, we can see that striped bass are negatively affected. They decline. Um, if we don't fish menhaden uh, at all, uh, the striped bass biomass would, would stay uh, relatively stable up here. Now the working group that was tasked with developing these ERPs was really focused on, on menhaden and a few key focal species, you know, striped bass, weak fish and bluefish I mentioned, as well as spiny dogfish and Atlantic herring. And so we have information on, on, on all those and, and the, the, the food web model really kind of provides this whole ecosystem perspective of what would happen to these other, uh, uh, other species. And so this is what I call the, the winners and losers plot, where on the x-axis you have these different scenarios that we ran on the Menhaden fishing mortality. So moving to the right, you have uh, a lot of removal of Menhaden from the system and a value of zero here means that we're not fishing Menhaden at all. And so the different colored lines represent different species in the model. And the y-axis is the biomass relative to the biomass we would expect if we didn't change anything in the system. So kind of the status quo. And so what we see, a lot of, a lot of different species just kind of hover around that one level, meaning that they're not tremendously impacted by changes in menhaden fishing. We did have a few species that were strongly negatively affected by menhaden fishing. So not surprisingly, menhaden, which is the black line, as we fish them harder, their biomass is declining. Uh, but we also had striped bass, which is this green line, as well as nearshore piscivorous birds, which is the, the dashed orange line. Uh, those would be things like osprey, pelicans, blue herons, et cetera. And so what we saw is that striped bass really is sensitive to the menhaden fishing mortality rate. And you'll see that that uh, ends up being important with, with how uh, management uh, decided to, to go and the, and the technical folks. So one of the things that um, caused this big model to not gain a lot of traction is that it's really complex. There's a lot of uncertainty. We don't have uh, the best data for some of these groups. And so what a colleague of mine from University of Florida, Dave Shigaris, what he did is he took the model and he simplified it down to the key components, those key species that uh, the managers were interested in. And he called that the NWACS MICE model, uh, standing for the model of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessment. And so this model is just more nimble, it's easier to update, computationally it's, it's more efficient, uh, so there's a lot of benefits to moving to this uh, more simple model. So much like the full model, we do fit to existing time series. Uh, this is just an example here of the fits to some of the observed data, the observed data being the points and the different lines being different 
um, different configurations of the model that were conducted for kind of sensitivity analysis purposes. Uh, but the black line on, on these plots represents the, um, the, the base model that we used. And so this is just looking at the fits to the biomass. And in general, things fit pretty well. And where they de deviated, like in uh, striped bass here, this is comparable to what the single species assessment fits looked like. So we're pretty, pretty happy with it. So we have these models that work and we have this overarching objective of sustaining menhaden to provide for predators, but that's pretty vague, right? Um, which predators do we want to sustain? At what level do we want to sustain them? So these are unanswered questions that the, the technical folks really had to kind of uh, provide some guidance and, and, and put some, some ideas out there to see how the managers responded. And so what we decided to do was to focus on striped bass because it was the most sensitive predator and um, one of the most um, kind of the poster child for the conflict with, with Menhaden. So we focused in on striped bass. And I just want to state up front that there's no single correct answer, right, to how to sustain men, Menhaden for, for predators. There's different levels. Um, and so I'll show you what we came up with uh, as, as a committee. So using that simplified uh, NOx mice model, we did the same kind of future projections as, as we did with the full model. And so here we see, again, striped bass biomass through time. Uh, the black line represents the striped bass biomass. And then we project forward under different Menhaden fishing scenarios. So the red uh, the red colors here represent what we expect to happen to menhaden, I'm sorry, excuse me, to striped bass when we fish menhaden really hard. And then the blue is what would, ex what, what would happen, we think, if we didn't fish menhaden hard at all. And we can compare what those effects are to what the target and the threshold biomasses are for the striped bass management, right? So that species is managed separately. And this is the, the target level that, that they're trying to maintain for striped bass is, is up here, this dashed line. And so the stock of striped bass was overfished and the populations weren't doing so well. And the idea is how can we get it back up to, to, that, um, to that target level or to that threshold level? And so these projections are all made assuming that the striped bass are fished at their target uh, fishing mortality, le mortality levels. And so what we can do is we can take a slice of this, right? So at this kind of terminal year of our projections, and we can see, well, how do things look under those different scenarios of Menhaden fishing? So in this plot, on the x-axis, we have the Menhaden fishing mortality, Great, so a lot of fishing on Menhaden to the right, no fishing on the left. And the y-axis is now what the expected striped bass biomass would be relative to that target that, that, that the striped bass managers are trying to achieve. And so here, this horizontal dashed line represents the target level for striped bass. And what we did for Menhaden is let's define the allowable fishing mortality for Menhaden to be the one that allows us to achieve the targets for striped bass. And that's what these vertical blue lines represent. So this uh, ERP F target is how hard we can fish Menhaden to achieve the, the target biomass of striped bass. And then we could do the same thing using the threshold levels. Now we do have to make some assumptions about what the state of the ecosystem is, how we're fishing uh, the other, other components. And in general, we saw that the, these ERP targets and thresholds were less, were lower values than what the single species stock assessment for Menhaden was, was depicting, as low as 30 to 40% lower. But the good news is that it was still, uh, above where the Menhaden fishing mortality rate was, which is this vertical green line. 
Now, without getting into the, the details, um, you know, these types of trade-off curves uh, can be sensitive to the assumptions we make about uh, fishing mortalities on other species in the system. For example, we did see some sensitivities to Atlantic herring, but this was a, a good starting point um, that was relatively robust comparing across the different models that were fit. So this represented a really uh, important step towards ecosystem-based fisheries management that was adopted. Um, this will continue evolving and changing, and the board is definitely interested in uh, continuing to uh, expand this type of application. Now, I, I will note that um, this is going to be an interesting process. This right now is the way that the ASMFC is structured. Right? We have the commission and a variety of different species-specific management boards. Now, for us to consider things more holistically, it's going to require feedback across these different management boards and bringing more people to the table to discuss those, those trade-offs. So in the last couple minutes here, um, I just wanted to kind of summarize what, I, what we thought were some of the key lessons learned from this whole process. And this is all um, summarized in the Anstead et al. 2021 paper. But um, it took a while to get things off the ground and, and moving. There was this kind of cyclical nature of the, the technical folks, the, the analysts and scientists, wanted more information and guidance from the managers to know how to define, um, to, to, to how to develop these ERPs. What, what are the ecosystem objectives? The managers, on the other hand, wanted more technical advice to be able to inform what those ecosystem objectives ought to be. And while this is happening, there's you know, complexities of different modeling approaches that could be used and different stakeholder inputs with different competing objectives and trade-offs. And this is all happening in a backdrop of complexity and novelty, uncertainty, limited resources. Um, one of the things that really started to break the stalemate was that uh, ecosystem objectives workshop, um, bringing these different stakeholders in, having it be mediated, and, and that really started kind of the, 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 I think the, it really picked up the process, I think sped up the process once we did that. There certainly are a variety of other challenges that were faced. Um, just to highlight a few, right? Gathering and vetting data uh, is, is always challenging. Uh, ad addressing uncertainty. So multiple models were fit. They largely were saying the same things. We did sensitivity analyses. There's obviously more that can be done, but uncertainty is something that we can't get, get away from and we have to be able to quantify it and, and just be truthful about it. Um, it definitely took a lot of, time and expertise and funding. I don't think this work would have been possible without some external support. And this transition to EBFM is, is really a big paradigm shift. And so we're embracing this incremental progress that we've made, but there's still a long way to go if we do wanna to move to kind of more holistic uh, ecosystem-based fisheries, uh, fish, fisheries management. And so to, to, to wrap up here, some, some of the directions where we're going, uh, there's still things that can be improved in the data and modeling, and we can talk about those in more detail um, if interested. I know Lisa was asking about uh, how to incorporate environmental change and uh, climate change, spatial dynamics, um, conducting some management strategy evaluations and dealing with these uncertainties. But uh, on the management front, Really, it's going to be you know bringing managers, bringing stakeholders together, and talking about these trade-offs and addressing you know competing objectives. Uh, and I think that applies a lot to some of the things that you all are are dealing with and talking about. And you're very familiar with that, uh, which is a complex issue. Um, and and we're hoping that we can kind of keep moving towards uh, more integrated EBFM. So there's definitely a lot of people that were involved. Um, I have this in the slide here, um, and it certainly would not have been possible uh, with, with just a few of us alone. So a lot of people were involved. 
I, I do have some of the key references here if you're interested, um, and I'm happy to chat more about uh, those things. But other than that, I think I'll, I'll pause there and, and would, would be happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Thank you, Andre. That was really interesting. And, and just for a little bit more background for the board, I, I specifically asked Andre to assess you know, how difficult it is to implement these things so that we can be thinking about whether there are tools we want to apply in the Delta that might be similar. So that, that's a potential focus of the food web uh, review, but it has yet to be defined, which is why we're here talking today. So I'll now pass to Steve. What's your question, Steve? Uh, first, a comment. I noticed that Ed Hood is listening in. So uh, welcome back, Ed. Ed is a former member of the Delta Independent Science Board. Uh, good to see your name. Um, I, first of all, I think this is a terrific approach. And it really, uh, what you're doing truly demonstrates the importance of predator-prey interactions and food webs in fisheries management, per se, but also in ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, so take these questions just more from a scientific curiosity. I, one, uh, two questions. One, one relates to um, your use of a single space, and I know there's an eco-space version of, you know, ecopath, eco salmon. They're using that in the northern Gulf of Mexico, where they divide the habitat up into spatial units. And in your case, you're covering quite a bit of space, which makes a lot of underlying assumptions about diet and and so forth. And there, and I wonder if you could comment if you could go to multiple spaces, would you have different results? The second related question is the sensitivity. I know the results are very sensitive to diet, but um, what is the sensitivity to environmental driving forces such as temperature? In your case, you're dealing with a wide temperature range from north to south, but also from a management point of view, if you start incorporating climate change in there, is there a way to do that to see how it might impact uh, these relationships? Yeah, excellent questions. Um, yeah, certainly the spatial component is something that uh, we've talked about. And the idea is, was to, you know, start simple and, and kind of build the, the main structure first and then add the complexity. Um, there have been other attempts to very coarsely break up the, the region, um, but, and Dave and I have, you know, talked about uh, and pitched some ideas of, of building in that spatial component. That's certainly one of the clear next steps to go. And as you were pointing out, um, the predator-prey interactions are occurring in space and in time, and different species are not going to overlap uh, in certain certain ways, right? In certain seasons, in certain times, and so that's definitely kind of the next step. One of the sensitivities that I just alluded to with Atlantic herring, uh, we kind of uncovered this is largely due to, to this mismatch of um, you know, space and time. So this was kind of a, a starting point and, and certainly adding space would be a, a logical next step. The, the second question that you asked related to kind of temperature and climate um, also is, an excellent question and, and kind of a clear uh, next direction to go. And just as an example, I did, uh, I didn't incorporate into the, the talk, but uh, a, a student, a master student of mine that re recently graduated, Max Greslick, part, part of his thesis um, was looking at some simulations where we look at potential climate effects. And so one, predicted effect of climate change in this region is that the, the primary production is going to decrease. The biomass of the phyto, phytoplankton is going to decrease, and, and some uh, studies have published values you know, ranging from 3.5% to about 6% decline in phytoplankton biomass. So what, what Max did was to simulate under these different scenarios what would happen. And without getting into the details, um, you know, ultimately what he saw was that we do see a decline in, you know, the biomass of these different species groups. Um, you know, just as an example, the plot on the right here is, you know, the blue line is what we would expect uh, under that most extreme decline in biomass. 
Um, and then the, the red line here is if there's no, no change in, in, in biomass. And then we can look at kind of the, uh, the bottom left graph here, kind of the winners and losers. So under those alternative scenarios, some species are gonna benefit and other species are, are not gonna do as well. So uh, we can at least start to identify some of the species that we think would be negatively impacted. Um, but I wanna acknowledge that this is not uh, climate effect you know, we're not looking at all the possible climate effects. You mentioned temperature increasing, uh, that, that could impact uh, distributions of species, predator-prey interactions. This is just looking at, um, at the change in the biomass at the base of the food web that's predicted with climate change. So there's definitely areas that we can move forward and, and start asking those questions. Uh, and we have to kind of start somewhere, but certainly that's gonna be, um, some key questions and considerations moving forward. Feel free to speak up if you have questions. <clears throat> Don't be shy. <clears throat> well, uh, let me follow up on the climate change one while we're waiting for uh, other voices. Well, thank you, Tanya. Um, so, I understand that you've been able, like, a quick a quick way to start looking at climate changes through the who eats whom part of the model. Uh, but do, is there a mechanism by which you could start to bring in physiological stresses or lack of habitat space? Or is, is there a way to do that? Or is that just outside the model entirely? Yeah, the, the way to incorporate those types of things would be, um, you know, this, this is more of a, you know, uh, balancing biomass exercise. Um, but what you could do is you can, you can include what are called uh, these forcing functions where you force different things to change through time. So we um, you know, forced the biomass of the phytoplankton to decline. If you uh, had reasonable evidence to suggest that the mortality rate for some species was going to decline or to increase as a function of physiological stress or something like that, you could force that into the model and, and, and have that mortality uh, rate changing through time. In terms of getting to kind of the, the, the more detailed physiology and those kinds of things, uh, you know, this model's not kind of focused on that. It would be more uh, at, at kind of this course level of how those environmental changes would impact things like mortality, uh, maybe consumption and, and, and those types of things. And then if, if you built in, if we had kind of a spatial component, then you could also start to play around with uh, movement rates and spatial distribution, which we're seeing, right? We're seeing um, more of a poleward shift to colder, uh, colder waters and deeper waters for a lot of these species. Okay, so what I'm hearing is you could either, you know, use other studies to force things a certain direction or potentially couple other models. Yeah, um, I'm not as familiar with kind of the model coupling side of things, but I know that uh, they have been doing some of that. And there are more complex food web models. Um, you know, one of the kind of full end-to-end -end models is, is known as Atlantis. I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with that, but um, there you have these sub-models for the biogeochemistry uh, in the oceanography, and then you have kind of the phytoplankton dynamics, and then you have a food web model for the fisheries, and then you can even have kind of economic uh, components and stuff. So those models get really complex really fast. Agreed. T Tanya, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you, Andre. This was a, a great presentation. And um, I, I guess I, I'm curious about kind of the the transportability of this type of modeling technique to other species and, and ecosystems. And I'm a social scientist, so I don't know, you know the, the ins and outs of, of a lot of this, but is there something about Menhaden that makes it you know, feasible, more feasible to do this type of modeling? Um, something about where it sits in the, in the food chain or the data, is it just the data availability that you have? Just, I'd love to hear you kind of talk through like how you see the, the feasibility of, of using similar approaches in other systems? Yeah, Tanya, that's an a excellent question too. I'll say that um, 
one of the reasons I think we were successful here is that there's a lot that forage fish like menhaden or, or herring and sardines, they, they have this really central role where we're fishing them, but they're also supporting predators. So there's a lot of interest and in, in economic consequences of how we manage uh, this fishery. And there's a lot of stakeholder interest and buy-in. Uh, so I do think that the interest in, in these approaches is really, and a lot of the development has been with forage fish. Uh, so you certainly have similar species, you know, here on the West Coast that would, would be amenable to that. Um, so in that regard, I think Menhaden is, is special. Um, and you, you know, wisely brought up this question of data availability. You know, one of the reasons, you know, that full model was really hard to kind of sell is we don't have good data on birds and marine mammals and whatnot. So by focusing in on the, the species that are fished and that we have relatively, relatively good data for, that allows us to kind of build these models with as best data as we, we have. There, even for them, particularly on the diet side, that's a limitation. Um, you know, we could always do better, better with that. Um, and then just more generally in terms of transferability and portability, any model like this, you're gonna to have to kind of develop for the system, you know, specifically, you can kind of borrow information from other, other places, but that's why it's, it's helpful to kind of get something built and then start to kind of tweak it and improve it uh, as, you, as you move forward. So, um, and, and these models are being developed in a variety of different ways. There's certainly a California current ecosystem model, um, and, and, and whatnot. And, and the spatial scale question is also important to circle back to Steve's uh, earlier comment. Thanks, Jay, go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Andre, go ahead, Jay. Um, Andre, this is great. Uh, I, I really like the, uh, the approach. For, for our Delta here, we have quite a mix of fish species, both native and non-native, and we have a lot of potential for additional invasive species coming in in different habitats, all in sort of near proximity. Um, and we have a warming climate. How do you, what do you think of the prospects of, of this kind of modeling, which, which I generally like, um, for conditions where you might have sort of new species popping up and, and uh, changing temperature sensitivity of various existing species. Huh? Yeah, those are <laughs> um, also great, excellent questions. Um, anytime you're extrapol extrapolating and, and kind of projecting into the future, there's a, a ton of assumptions that go into it. And um, I've definitely seen people that put too much stock in these types of projections and some that I would say maybe don't put enough stock. Like the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? All models are wrong, some are useful. I'd argue that this type of modeling approach is, is useful. Um, but there are, yeah, these uncertainties, um, you know, I think it'd be harder to, you know, to try to incorporate just some unknown species that we, you know, is that, that may pop up. I mean, you could try to include like, a species that is starting to establish itself, right? Um, right. I'm working with like Sacramento pikemen up here in the eel, um, right? You can include them in there. And if you have information to kind of see what the potential consequences would be. And in terms of those, those temperature effects, again, you'd probably want to have uh, some predictions of what the temperature effects would be on very specific components of say mortality or consumption, but that's also, that's, it's hard to do, right? Um, I, I can imagine that you could, if, if the model runs fast enough, you, you could develop some, some sort of robust testing kind of approaches that would identify what kinds of fish that, of what kinds of characteristics would be most threatening. And then you could target those classes of invasive species for preemption. Yeah, and, and a that, that's, a, that's a good idea. And in general too, 
with, with these types of approaches, we often are just kind of establishing scenarios, right? Um, and, and, and hopefully you would kind of bracket out what some uh, reasonable potentials would be. And then you can see, you know, what, what the range of potential outcomes might be. Um, but yeah, the sensitivity and dealing with those uncertainties is, is kind of a, something we can't get away from. Thank you very much. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on that same line of uh, thought in that, um, you know, I guess the, the opposing question is, is it better than nothing? And I think that, uh, you know, if you got an invasive species coming in and, and you're just guessing what the impact might be, or if you take a species out such as menhaden, what the impact might be, at least if you have a food web model of this sort, you can begin to play those games. Certainly there's uncertainty around it, but you might even get the direction of change correct, whereas right. you may not under other circumstances. It seems one of the key things about applying this from system to system, the modeling framework is, is pretty straight, it's set. It's a matter of filling in the uh, largely the diet composition. And I think uh, that I don't know. I don't know if you go, and maybe Peter knows this better, if you go into the Delta how much do we know about the diet composition of the key players and um, <clears throat> particularly the piscivores <clears throat> and um, and because that's that's sort of a key to, to setting all this up. Yeah, I, I will say certainly the diet compositions are important. Um, you know, Tim Essington from the University of Washington has done some some studies on sensitivities of these modeling approaches generally. Uh, you know, one of his main findings was that the model tends to be a, a bit more sensitive to the, the, the biomass estimates. So getting kind of the relative magnitude of biomass for, for different species can also be, be challenging and kind of squaring them up, even if you have an estimate for one species, and then which is more of an index, and then for another species kind of getting those right. And there are some gui there, there's guidance out there. Uh, on kind of best practices for for building and developing these models, um, but uh, yeah, and and I think your point is a good one in that you know something is better than nothing. You can ask those questions, and you can use it as a tool to kind of guide um, research questions, right? If it's if if you build these models and and ask these questions and find out, wow, it really is sensitive to the diet composition. So okay, we need to. Uh, allocate more resources here, or you know, there's this one invasive species that is kind of starting to boom, and what happens to them is going to have a could have a huge impact on the system. You know, it, it can kind of give you some ideas of what to focus in on, and you can ask those questions and kind of test them out in this virtual framework um, to at least have some plans moving <sighs> forward. Yeah, very interesting. Any other thoughts from the board? I think you probably glossed over some of the management difficulties of getting the stakeholders to agree, Andre, but it does seem that they uh, they were motivated, right? So they, they were motivated to improve the fishery because the, the striped bass were not doing well and uh, things like that. So that I think from an outsider perspective, that seemed like a key driver of pushing people back to the table. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to kind of capture it all, but um, I, I will say that for the, I think this situation is far easier and fewer stakeholders than the types of questions that you all deal with in the Delta. Um, and, but, but yeah, with those competing objectives, competing interests, um, it actually went relatively smoothly. Um, it does help also that that uh, the reduction fishery, which is that you know three quarters of the landings, is just it's just one business, uh, one company that's that's responsible for that. Um, so that, that that also helps as well. Mm, that's an interesting point. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I think we'll we'll wrap this up and go to our next speaker. Yeah. We, um, we do have a public yeah. comment. Oh, public comment. Thank you, Edmund. Yeah, we have one from Deirdre Desjardins. 
Um, Deirdre, you have the permission to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation before you provide your public question. Thank you. Um, it's Deirdre, Deirdre Dion, California Water Research. Um, so there was a study uh, that was done by Samuel Sandoval Solis and other researchers at UC Davis. Uh, I think it came out two years ago. It showed that 97% of the Delta's primary production had been lost um, because of the invasive clam, Potom Corbula amaranthus, um, operations of the state and federal water projects. And I just wanted to ask the speaker um, how the model might change if you had a trophic collapse like that. Yeah, thanks, Deirdre. Um, yeah, if, if that were kind of the, the rate of change in primary production, uh, it's nice that you can use the model to ask those types of questions, right? What would happen if we were able to restore the primary production to what it had been, maybe by managing uh, this invasive species? Or what are the consequences of maintaining the primary production at that low level? So you can at least you can ask those questions and play those scenarios, um, which is one of the nice things about having this, this type of model. Thank you. Okay, right. thank you, Andre. That was uh, really helpful. Do we have any other public comments, Edmund? There are no additional public comments, thank you. Okay, great. So we're, we're gonna keep thinking about that. We may ask you more questions in the future, Andre. So our next speaker, I think for anyone who's worked on fish in the Delta, he needs no introduction, but just to be sure, uh, Peter Moyle is a distinguished professor emeritus and associate director of the Center for Watershed Sciences at UC Davis. And he has studied the ecology and conservation of fishes in freshwater and estuarine habitats in California for over 50 years. And that's included studies of fishes in the Susan Marsh and the Delta, I don't know, still learning names. Uh, and he's gonna share some of his extensive knowledge by providing an overview of the Delta fish. And in, in particular, explaining why some fishes have become super abundant, others are headed for extinction, all while being participants in a novel ecosystem. So with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you for being here. Peter, you're, you're muted. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so I'm afraid my talk is going to be the sort of the polar opposite of the one you just heard, which is very focused and quite elegant in terms of the modeling. Um, I'm, this, will be, this will be much more chaotic. Um, and uh, because I, I trying to, summarize everything we know about delta fishes um, to give you an overview is, uh, is something is it's not easy to do but it's sort of fun to try and this is sort of this talk is really sort of highlights of what we know about delta fishes um, first thing i want you to do is look at this map that's uh, associated with the introductory slide here um, and you can see that um, uh, uh, to map of the delta, but the, the key areas that I've been working in primarily are Susan Marsh, which is, you can see, uh, and, and follow that, what we call the North Delta, um, uh, uh, this North, North Delta arc, uh, you follow it up into the Biolo Bypass, that's where the, where with primarily a freshwater system, and that's, those are the places where I've been focusing my own efforts. The rest of the delta is, is very different. Uh, but much more dominated by non-native by, by non-native species than is this section. So I, can I have the next slide? Well, I, I want to emphasize we know a lot about delta fishes. Um, there's been monitoring going on, uh, systematic monitoring going on since 1957, and they, these are fish surveys of one sort or another. And there, right now, there are at least 14 fish surveys with 18 years of sampling. Uh, or more sampling. So we have a lot of information about delta fishes and a lot of this is, I summarized 
for um, a lot of John Durand and uh, um, others about uh, for for the for a bunch of Southern California groups, including the California Coast Keeper, who are interested in in, in what what do we know about uh, the native fishes in the Delta, and what can we do to make sure to, in, my, in managing water, which is their interest. What can we do in managing water to um, improve their situation? Uh, next slide. And this is a slide to sort of illustrate this point. Um, the, the graph on the on the right is the, the classic um, data that everybody uses to talk about the, the status of status of, of delta fishes. That's the fall midwater trawl surveys. Um, and what you can see is a lot of fluctuations in numbers of, of key species. This, was, this, by the way, is just for pelagic, for this, pelagic species, which has been the biggest concern about. Um, and what you see a lot of fluctuations, and then and then towards as you get into closer to the, the present era, things get really populations get really low. And this is a four species with very different uh, uh, ways of approaching different different life histories. Uh, well, one of the things that we've done recently, this is primarily the work of Dylan Stomp, who is a, um, a, a PhD student with me. Um, it was to find ways to combine the surveys. And this other this graph on the, on the left shows you the results from looking at four pelagic fishes um, from eight to eight surveys at 221 different stations throughout the Delta and, and, and uh, the estuary over a 40 year period. And obviously, what this shows you is the same thing in a way of what you're seeing in the Paul Midwater Trawl um, catch. But here, it's, it's, it occurs a little bit smoother because of the, the different fishes respond in slightly different ways to environmental change. But the same thing is going on. You can see we had a major decline in these pelagic fishes in the 1980s, a slight recovery, and then um, back down to really low numbers again. And this is obviously an ecosystem wide problem for the entire. Uh, higher estuary, uh, or, or at least the upper estuary. The next slide. And this is also related to this idea of, uh, of delta inflow and exports, because the, the blue uh, colored bars here are show you the uh, amount of water that flows into the delta uh, each year, the, the total amount and the uh, bottom. This is a stack, a stack bar graph. The bottom red. The red is the amount, amount that's export exported. And what you notice that is that in dry years, the amount of water exported could be a very significant percentage of the amount of water flowing in, and that, that's that's obviously a, a a problem for the fish. You also notice the gray bars there are drought periods, and it looks like we're entering into another one right now. And you, you notice again, uh, inflows tend to Decrease during during uh, decrease during drought, but exports tend to remain pretty much the same at least until very recent years. And this obviously has reflects with something that's going on in the ecosystem and affects all these fishes. Next slide. And you know, there's also this problem is the, the because these fish are in the middle of California's water supply system, which is what the delta is. There's been a lot of money out there to do research on them, but the research has not helped the, some of the, all these species that much. This shows you the um, number of publications on Delta smelt. It's a, I need to update it, but it shows you the number of publications keeps going up, but Delta smelt numbers keep going down. Uh, I'm not sure what that proves, but it shows that you, you, science is great, but you need to have management that uses the science to make a difference. Next slide. And there, in the Delta smell was not the only listed species in the system. It was listed in 1993. Um, we have long pin smell, green sturgeon, winter run Chinook salmon, spring run Chinook salmon, and Central Valley steelhead. Uh, these are all endangered species, and they all have to be managed as, as they go through the Delta. Uh, and, it, when, and when they are in the Delta, that, this makes a considerable difference in how you manage these systems for water supply. Um, and I might add the winter run Chinooks was actually listed in 1989 as the first species uh, of, of the six to be listed. And of course, 
the you start looking at the data, you realize there are other fish out there that might qualify for listing in the very near future. Next slide. And I want to put this in context to of California's rather unique native fish fauna, because um, what goes on in the Delta reflects what's going on in the rest of the state as well. We have 130 native species in the state and native freshwater fish species. Um, and 80% of these fish, roughly 79%, are endemic to California, or including watersheds that may go out of the state for short distances. But this is so. This is our, the species like the Delta smelt and so forth are California problems. Uh, there's no really no equivalent elsewhere. Next slide. Uh, and also, there's a statewide decline in fish. Uh, there are, we've already lost seven species um, uh, from the system. Um, we have 30 species that are listed under state and federal ESAs as threatened or endangered. Um, and then there are 63 species that are fish species of special concern in California. And this is a, a, a list maintained by the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, for species that are in decline and may be likely to be in trouble in the future. So statewide, you could argue that 71% of all the fish in California are in serious decline or trouble. So what goes on in the Delta is, is a reflection of what's going on statewide. Each species has a different, different problems in some respects but they're all related. Next slide. And of course the extinct native species are, these are the thick-tailed chub, just the last one was collected in 1955. That's a globally extinct species. The Sacramento perch, once a very abundant species, uh, is, is fortunately still around because it has been planted in ponds and reservoirs all over the West, but it's, it's gone from its native habitat, which is the Delta. Both these species were uh, some of the were two of the most abundant species in the system um, prior to the arrival of Europeans. Uh, when you look at Indian middens, these are the two of the most common remains. These fish are the most uh, among the most abundant. Next slide. But on top of this, we have constant invasions of non-native species. We have 50 alien species of non-native species of fish present in every watershed in the state. Uh, not all fishy in, every, in any given watershed, but they're, they're spread around. And a lot of these fish are in the, in the Bay Delta system. Uh, this obviously makes, makes, creates a lot of complications when you're trying to manage the native fishes. And of course, the non-native fishes are just a reflection of species invasions in general. Uh, the San Francisco estuary has been listed as the most invaded, invaded estuary in the world. The invertebrates and everything else added together can be close to 200 species. Next slide. But getting back to the delta, it does have a very diverse fish fauna. If you're out there sampling on a regular basis, like the sampling program I set up in 1979, uh, you could count on getting around 26 to 30 common species in, in your samples. Um, and about half of those fish you'll capture will be non native fish. Next slide. Uh, and what fish you capture make there's is somewhat it is dependent on where you're fishing too. The delta, for example, that is maintained as a freshwater system. It sort of wants to become salty, uh, but it's maintained artificially basically as a freshwater system. Uh, yeah, then, then as you follow the salinity, the salinity gradient, as you track that salinity gradient downstream, you see the middle reaches of Susun Bay and so forth, and the Susun Marsh again are brackish, and that's are some of the most productive and some of the most um, rich species rich areas. And then you then the then then you get it down into San Francisco Bay, which is basically basically a saltwater system. But we're talking today mainly about the upper two areas, the, the brackish water and the freshwater areas. Next slide. Um, and this slide is sort of, you, I put, put together is just to show you, look at, look at the body shapes of these fish in relation to the, the, the basic habitat they occur, whether they're in the elven waters at the surface, in midwater, uh, in midwater, like it's striped bass, uh, or rather they're on the bottom or on the edge, these species, this is a wide diversity of body shapes. And 
to me anyway, this, you could, you, if you didn't know what these fish were, you could swear this was a co-evolved system because these fish are so different from one another. Next slide. And what you see, the, the, this, these, this community of fishes is a mixture of native and non-native species. We've done actually some formal analyses on these and they, they, they do come out nicely. You get some species that overlap more than others, but by and large, um, studies of diet overlap and habitat overlap and so forth show a lot of segregation among the species. Next slide. And you see this also in the long-term data sets. This is our Susu Marsh data again. Um, and what you see from 1980 through 2020 on this slide is that the, the bottom, the purple is the um, native species, the light blue is the non-native. And you can see these two in the general groups track one another in abundance. Uh, they are, that which generally means they're responding to environmental conditions in the estuary in, pretty, in, in similar ways. Um, and they're also responding to the introductions of new species, such as the overbite clam, um, and to another species of fish. So both the Shibofiri and Shokahazi Gobi have invaded the, the, the system since I started working on it. Um, and others like the Siberian prawn are reaching very large numbers. So there's a whole, constantly dealing with new species coming in, as well as with natural changes such as drought, and then artificial changes, in this case, Susan Marsh has some big salinity control gates, which were put up in the 1980s to keep the marsh fresher. Next slide. So overall, though, you can conclude the delta is very poor habitat for pelagic fishes, which are some of the more important fishes in the system. Um, and this shows you just the numbers of striped bass and juvenile striped bass in the Paul Midwater Trawl. Very important species. Um, for the system overall, but the juveniles are in decline, except I might add in, in Susan Marsh. Next slide. Again, we go back to this idea of these different surveys and that this, this decline in pelagic fish uh, is a general phenomenon that reflects a decline in the, in the whole pelagic uh, open water system in the estuary. And indeed, you find many other species of fish uh, have a similar pattern of decline. Next slide. Well, I, I want to do, no, give now give you some sort of non-random fish stories. Um, we talk about these five different species to give you a flavor for what's going on in the system um, with, with, with each of these species. Chinook salmon, split tail, delta smelt, Mississippi silver sides, and striped bass. Uh, I figure this is the easiest way to talk about the way this, what's going on with fish in the, in the, in the delta and elsewhere in the estuary. <clears throat> Next slide. Well, this is the, the, the data on the uh, fall run Chinook salmon. This is the dominant salmon run in the system and the one that supports the commercial and sport fisheries. Uh, Obviously, the salmon have to move up through the estuary, including the delta, as adults to move up into the rivers to spawn. And the juveniles then have to move down these rivers that go through the delta and the estuary to go back out to sea to grow up. Well, these small juveniles are very vulnerable to climate change or any kind of major environmental change in the system, especially in the delta. And they're also vulnerable to predation and, and, and other factors. Uh, and the run itself these days is, is because of the juvenile mortality is so high really, are largely supported by hatcheries. So this is a, a totally conservation dependent species and the hatcheries are necessary to support the fishery essentially. But what you've seen despite that, in recent years, the Chinook salmon have been on a steady decline and again for a whole variety of reasons that, that come together. The next slide. <clears throat> And the run of salmon that is doing the worst is, is the winter run Chinook salmon. This is a, a run that's unique to California in that it, it, can't, it comes up in, this, in, this, in the winter months, uh, up into the rivers and spawns uh, in the spring and its eggs incubate during the summer months. Uh, you say that's got to be crazy for a, a fish that's in the, in the, at the southern end of the range of the species. 
Well, the reason they can do that is that historically there in, in, a, in a couple of spring-fed rivers, especially the McLeod River, which is a, um, a, a, a large, good-sized river with a really uh, uh, big, huge cold water springs that they keep it flowing. So it meant that these fish could come in and take advantage of a habitat that other salmon were not using because they were using it at a time of year when nobody else was around. Um, well, obviously, the construction of Shasta Dam cut off, uh, cut off access to the McLeod River. The result was the winter and now then became completely dependent on releases from the hatchery. Rather, I'm sorry, completely dependent on releases from the dam uh, of cold water. That meant you have to maintain that cold water pool in the Shasta Reservoir to save that water to use during the summer to keep the winter run juveniles alive. And what's happened now several times, but specifically last, last year in 2021, was that almost all of the winter run juveniles that were in the gravel died because they, um, the Bureau of Reclamation had released water earlier in the year for farming, for farmers, and did not save enough of the cold water in the pool uh, toward the salmon. So they ran out of, warm, of cold water. The warm water then killed the juveniles. Um, this makes the winter run uh, and really an almost entirely a hatchery dependent run again. It was pretty much getting that way anyway, but there was a small wild population going. So there, this event, they have to find other solutions to try to keep the winter run up going. Um, but a very typical problem for California. Next slide. And then we get to the Delta smelt. This is a, a fish I've been working with since the 1970s. And, and I became the world expert on Delta smelt as an assistant professor because nobody else wanted to study it. Because at that time, it was a really abundant fish in the system, one of the most abundant fishes in the system. And was, but, so it was easy, a, a very abundant fish and easy to get samples of, so easy to do studies on. Um, but what you see in, in, in this graph here is the, the, the two smelt, the long-term smelt and the delta smelt, the, the delta smelts on the top of the picture there. And a wide fluctuate, a general decline in abundance we see in the 1980s, a race resurgence, and then uh, a disappearance from the system. The delta smelt today is basically gone from the wild. Um, as far as probably no one yet wants to declare it extinct in the wild, but it's this has got to be the year where you could do it. it is, but it is being maintained now by a hatchery. Uh, something I never thought they could do because it's such a delicate species, but it's now being raised for its entire life cycle through in, in hatcheries. But it has a one year life cycle, two if you're lucky. That means this species is very vulnerable to anything that in one year it, ha it has to be. It, it's very vulnerable to genetic disorders. It's very vulnerable to anything that goes on uh, in the system. And the fact it has such a short life cycle tells you that historically the Delta always had a good, always had a place for it somewhere. There's always a species that could be maintain its abundance despite a one or two year life cycle. Uh, and indeed some of the otolith work that was been done on some of the uh, last remaining fish suggests that they have multiple strategies for using uh, the estuary. And it's just too bad it's, it's disappeared because it's a fascinating fish in so many ways. Next slide. Then on the opposite, we have a species which is increasing in numbers. This is the, the Mississippi silverside. Uh, it was introduced uh, actually into uh, uh, a Clear Lake um, in 1979, and has since uh, actually 1969. It's since then spread through the system. Uh, it arrived in the Delta in the early 1970s. Uh, and it's now one of the most abundant fish. And it's a fish that lives primarily in the edge habitat uh, a lot, uh, uh, in the sloughs. Uh, and it occurs in every, it occurs in salt water, it can occur in fresh water. It's a uh, urihaline. Uh, and unfortunately, the place where it likes to hang out on the edges of the sloughs is also where the delta smelts spawn. And we, we know from experiments that it's a uh, voracious predator on eggs and larvae of, of delta smelt and it any other fish he, he could get hold of. Um, but as you can see here, its numbers have gone up and down according to various factors, but its general trend has been up. Uh, and this <clears throat> and numbers are still still going up. And it's obviously one of the many factors 
uh, affecting the elder smell populations. Next slide. Well, you heard about striped bass in the last talk, so I can say a little bit about, more about it here. It's introduced into California in the 1870s. Uh, it quickly became abundant and became a species that is um, it was well adapted, uh, pre-adapted, you might say, to the San Francisco estuary. Um, it's a species which uses the entire estuary and the, and the rivers that flow into it for its life cycle. It goes up into the Sacramento River to spawn. The juveniles come down, or the eggs wash downstream, the larvae hatch in the, in the low salinity zone, and usually around Susun Bay, where, where historically there was abundant food. Um, they, and then they grow up and spend spend the rest of the life in the estuary um, with the juveniles and the adults showing some segregation, although juvenile striped bass can also be an important food for the adult bass. Um, some of the bass go out to sea, but most do not. So here's a fish which uses the entire estuary, but it's a non-native species. Uh, and so, so it's a species I increasingly think is probably the best indicator we have, species we have of delta, of, um, delta and estuary and health. Uh, but other people look upon it as a voracious predator. Non-native fish and it feeds on salmon and other, other native fishes. Therefore, it must be bad. Uh, and when I, I see just the opposite that when, there's always been predators out there and it just simply replaced the native predators that were once present. Next slide. Uh, I want to show you juvenile, juvenile bass numbers in Susan Marsh. Um, the, the marsh is turning out to be a place we think is actually a refuge for, for, the, for the pelagic fishes and uh, native fishes in the system, uh, which has been a bit of a surprise, uh, one of the surprising results of our studies. So this is declining elsewhere. The juvenile numbers are way down elsewhere, but in the marsh, they're remaining fairly steady. Uh, and this shows you the results from two different sampling programs. We have one, one based on seines, the other based on trawls. Next slide. Well, that's the, the, the final species I want to talk about is the Sacramento split tail. This is a native species. Um, and you, you, you can track its abundance here in the marsh, uh, which is, a, is actually its principal habitat. It, 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 when I first started working out there in the 1980s, it was an abundant fish and then it, then it went into an abrupt decline. It was briefly listed as a threatened species in the 1990s. But then its population is recovered in part because it's, it spawns on floodplains. And there are some restorations that on floodplains upstream in, in, in the, on the Cosumnes River and in the, in the Yellow Bypass. So it had what it needed to complete its life cycle once again, which was which is basically you rear in brackish water in the feeding on mice and shrimp and other species. When the spring, the spring high flows come, you rock it upstream and, and go out and spawn on floodplains on any, any flooded land you can, you, you can find. It. One of his favorite substrates for its eggs, for example, are cockle burrs, where the eggs can stick to. The eggs then hatch, uh, and the, 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 the floodplains are very productive, so the juveniles grow for a month or so. And then as the, as the water drops in the floodplains, they bail out and swim back or get carried back downstream to Susan Marsh or to the lower reaches of the estuary. Um, and you can see from this diagram here, in recent years, the numbers have been, been pretty good. I want you to look at the blue uh, because that's, that, that's pretty significant. That shows you the abundance of young of the year. Uh, and you can see that there are many years when their reproduction basically fails, uh, but these fish live long enough so they can maintain a population. For uh, indefinitely, as long as there's a periodic periodic success uh, in in spawning and in the floodplain rearing, but it's interesting that this is a species that is re, that has rebounded a bit because of restoration projects and a totally different kind of habitat. Next slide. So here are the basic conclusions. Then I've talked rather fast, but you can. I hope you got some of these basic ideas. We have a fish fauna that's surprisingly well documented. Uh, there was lots we need to know about many of these fishes yet, but we actually know a lot about them. The assemblages of fish you find in any given place in the system uh, vary somewhat, but they're a mixture of native and non-native species. 
The native species are disappearing, however, uh, and they're doing their best in the, in the areas where you have either the Sac close association with the Sacramento River, where, the, where you have clean, cold water available, um, and you have floodplains and other habitats that favor the native fishes. Um, the pelagic fishes in general are in decline, uh, and which is reflected especially in the delta smelt, which is a species which, uh, just despite uh, enormous amount of research going into its life cycle and factors affecting its, its health has disappeared from the wild and is now maintained entirely uh, as a hatchery fish. Um, and that, of course, reflects what's also going on with Chinook salmon, the, 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 the other important species in the system. Next slide. So I just want to remind you again that the the water is the issue here. Um, for all these fish, directly or indirectly, it's how we use water uh, in the delta and, uh, and upstream that, re that reflects on their ability to survive in the future years. <clears throat> yet, again, you know, we have this, uh, in this diagram, the, 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 the effect of, you see the effects of drought as well as the effects of diversion of water. So next slide. The basic problem we have then in California is competition for water. Uh, and it's, water is a, is a scarce resource and you have two major competitors, the fish and people, and the people are winning. Next slide. So thank you. I hope we give you plenty of chance for questions. Well, thank you, Peter. That was so helpful and uh, <laughs> It was a whirlwind tour, but it made it made a lot of sense and we learned a lot. So especially as new board members, I assume the old board members learned less, but uh, that was great. That was really wonderful. Uh, Bob. Well, Peter, first of all, thank you for an excellent presentation and a presentation that for a new board member was very sobering, uh, but I did ap appreciate it very much, the overview. And I also appreciated greatly the uh, reading that you sent for us to prepare for today. Um, I do have a question, though, uh, in terms of, you know, of all the years that you've been working in the Delta, um, what do you see as the perhaps, you know, one or two biggest issues that uh, out there, I, I know you mentioned water was certainly the number one, but how could the, uh, how could this board actually help resolve some of these issues or move the situation uh, towards uh, some sort of a more positive outcome. Uh, what role do you, would you see for us and specifically what could we do to help the situation? Well, that's such a difficult question because you know, it, it, the, the problem with water being uh, so important in California is that uh, it's a lever that the managers can push. You, know, you can use some control over the water coming into the Delta and some control over water being exported and we know it has some effect on fish populations but it's 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 only one problem of many um and more, more recently the, um, the problems have come from invasive species we have the you know, this overbite clam which has taken away most of the primary productivity from the system that used to be important for the pelagic fish uh, it literally coats the bottom and the brackish water parts of the estuary uh, and has changed it from a, a pelagic productivity to benthic productivity. Um, we have these invasive, uh, uh, invasive aquatic weeds, uh, Brazilian water weed and water hyacinth and so forth that choke up channels and um, uh, make it and, and create a totally habitat that favors non-native species like largemouth bass and bluegill and definitely do not favor the natives. Um, we have the Mississippi Silverside, which is in taking over the shallow water habitats. So those are problems that are very hard to deal with because um, you can't, it's hard to get rid of an invasive species once it's in, you, all you can do is control it. So certainly one of the things to, to, to be looking into is are there ways you can control some of these species? Can you actually reduce numbers of the invasive clams, for example? I, I think there may be ways to do that. Um, and can you, and perhaps another important thing is just to, to emphasize you need to um, find ways to stop new invasions coming in because new species are coming in all the time. 
there's a lot of effort being made to um, to reduce this, but they still manage to come in. Uh, and I don't know what can be do done much except more stringent uh, controls and regulations. Uh, but one thing is certainly is to uh, also is to recognize species, for each species for what they are. Recognize that we now have a system which is a novel ecosystem. Uh, it's not going to change, and trying to bring it back to some pristine state is just never going to happen. So make it being realistic about that. I think this is really, really an important uh, vision to have for the future of this. But recognizing we still need to do what we can to keep the native fishes going. Um, and in the case, uh, sorry, I'm sort of rambling here, but one of the things that, that I'm looking at especially is the idea of floodplains. Floodplains are really good for salmon. Floodplains are really good for split tail and probably some other native fishes too. So encouraging the protection and management of floodplains for fish is certainly a, a major issue. Um, and finally, I, I, just something that, that you will probably hear from Jay Lund if you haven't already, is the importance um, of Delta Islands, recognizing that the Delta is going to be changing dramatically in the future as a result of sea level rise uh, and of, of climate change, which will inc is increasing the big floods and so forth. Um, those islands, many of those islands are going to become submerged. They're somewhere 20, 20 feet or more below sea level already. The levees are going to break and they're going to fill up with water. And they could, some of that water could be salt water. So there's a need to find, look, look at those on a rational basis and try to figure out how you can manage the delta of the future, because it's going to change. And all these changes are, are predictable. But there's also a lot of you know how people are. They want the, well, they want the status quo because they're used to it. Um, and and trying to uh, uh, disabuse people of that and that things are going to change and you need to find um, new and better ways of solving some of these problems uh, is, is very important. That's going to serve a rambling answer. <laughs> no, actually, Peter, that was a great answer uh, uh -huh. uh, because it actually raised a lot of issues that I think. Uh, this board uh, can begin to look into in the coming years. And I think especially the idea that this is a, a, a novel ecosystem that's continuing to evolve, to change over time and doing it rather rapidly. Yeah. Is, uh, trying to identify what are the principles, uh, both scientific and management principles that we might apply to such a rapidly changing novel uh, ecosystem. Uh, those sorts of things in my mind are paramount in going forward and trying to come up with that, you know, that vision of the future of how we might manage a big complex system towards something that retains a, a good part of its original vitality, uh, you know, in the future. I think there's a lot of room for some really great discussion here and some great things that uh, I think, uh, you know, can be done that would be, that may work, that actually may yeah. work. You know, any ideas that you'd like, you know, to share with us going forward, I think would be truly appreciated uh, by this group. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Laurel. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, thanks to Peter for just a really great presentation. Sure. I, I certainly benefited from the summary and learned a lot. One of the things that you kind of touched on a little bit that I'd like to hear more extended thoughts on is the role of predation. And you touched on it when you showed the correlation between native and non-native fishes and um, indicated that the correlation implied that they were forced by common external factors. But then you also alluded to predation when you talked about these different perceptions of striped bass and the role that it plays in the Delta. And my question is, how much of an issue, or I guess, how much prioritization do these questions that the community have has around predation deserve? <laughs> um, I'm just curious to hear more thoughts on that. Well, there's some segments of the people who, who work in the Delta and who are uh, live there. Um, I, 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 especially the water water purveyors, um, 
the tendency is to want to blame predation as a cause of declines of fish, as opposed to environmental conditions. Because it's, it seems fairly obvious, you know, you have these big predatory fish out there and they, you, you, you look in their guts and they're often feeding on salmon uh, or they, they, well, Delta smelt seem to have been fairly immune to predation, but they no doubt were important prey at one time. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize that predation is, 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 and get people to recognize that predation is a natural factor. Striped bass are a species, which is a big predator out there, but they replaced for, before striped bass, there are native predators out there. Plus there are all kinds of birds and other animals that, that are predators on fish as well. So um, somehow we have to get away from this idea that predation, you know, somehow if you can, uh, control of predators, you can solve all the Delta's problems. Um, you have to get away from that kind of thinking, and it's still out there. Um, but I was going to say the way I look at it is predation. These predation is a natural problem, uh, but it's often associated with, with habitats that have all dramatically altered. For example, largemouth bass, which are also accused, of, they're non native fish, often accused as a, to be a predator. They're uh, become abundant mainly because they're associated with the base of aquatic weeds, which has created a whole different habitat that was not there before. Um, yet it's very hard to demonstrate that they have any effect on elder fish populations at all. Um, their diets are primarily crayfish. They're feeding on to some extent on bluegill and other non-native fish. Um, and yet there's a tendency to want to blame them <clears throat> for declines of fish. So somehow it's, I think it's getting back to the comment that is, we have to look, in, look upon our system as a novel ecosystem that has all these components that natural systems have um, and they're going, going to continue to have uh, and not try to look at, at manipulating one aspect, one part of the ecosystem to, uh, to save native fishes or whatever your goal is, especially to save water. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Go ahead. Thanks, Peter. Uh, great talk. I enjoyed it. You you raise a. Uh, I have a lot of questions that I'm not sure I'll ever get to one, but yeah. I, I. You you raise, uh, a lot of interesting thoughts and hypotheses and correlations. And I, you know, when I look at your uh, examples of individual fish changes, there are a lot of things that are correlated with it or could have driven it or or something like that. And, and uh, um, the, the clam is one example with, as you know, with, you know, and, and what you say about the clam reminds me exactly what happened with the uh, zebra mussel and quagga mussel in the Great Lakes. We had rapid ecosystem change and, and, uh, and the whole lower trophic level phytoplankton productivity just went away. And um, and also you mentioned the, the uh, smelt as uh, that the silver side overlapped their spawning grounds and fed on the young smelt. Yeah. That's exactly what happened to the yellow perch population with an alewife invasion in the Great Lakes and largely really had major impact. Um, so I, I guess, you know, in some cases, some of the explanations, like for example, silver side pred predation on smelt could be in and of itself sufficient to explain their disappearance. If you get sure. a new critter coming in and go right at that and hitting them at the early stages, that could wipe them out regardless of any uh, um, changes in food resources or habitat restoration or anything like that. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, given that, you know, that I don't view predation as one thing. I view the food web and talking about phytoplankton production, predation on prey and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of things going on. And so where do you recommend going forward, if you had a, some new scientific knowledge or new tools, how would you go about, what kind of tools would you need to manage this novel ecosystem down the road, scientific tools and uh, our information and where, where is the biggest need for science, getting after what Bob's kind of suggested too. Sure. Um, well, I, I, again, I, I always get to toot the horn of Susan Marsh because that's where I've done so much work, but it's also, uh, a relatively small part of the total Bay Delta system. And it's got a big tidal gates on it, so you can regulate the sunny so much to a certain extent. And most of it's, uh, most of the land in there is either wildlife 
refuges or or, or, or duck hunting clubs. Um, so there's one, one area that that in the future you could actually manipulate it in ways to favor native native and fishes and species like striped bass. So it's trying to find where are the areas you can actually do something with. And, and the North Delta is another place. It's unfortunately it's changing very rapidly now as, as aquatic weeds have invaded. Um, but that was another place where we were studying it and, and finding out that there that all these backwater sloughs and so forth have still had fairly looked like they had fairly high productivity. Um, and were um, uh, good places for rearing juvenile fish and so forth. Um, so I think that just to figure out where are the habitats that you can manipulate to favor native fish and, and other and desirable species might be a better way to do it. Where are those habitats and, 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 where, and what, what can you do to manipulate them in, in a way that keeps some of these non-native species at bay or at least Keeps keeps them from being so dominant that they crowd out the, <clears throat> the species you want. Uh, not easy, obviously, because we're talking about large scale experiments. But we've already shown that with uh, on the Olo Bypass, floodplain manipulation by rice farmers and, and others is really possible uh, if you get to get everybody together, and that that has some very positive effects on salmon and steelhead populations. So it's things like this that. Uh, we we have to be uh, have to be able to take advantage worry about and take advantage of and do and, and restore habitats where we can. Um, but trying to manipulate change the system and in, 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 over in a large a large scale is is very unlikely uh, unless you can figure out some way to to actually control numbers of species like the uh, over overbite clam. Uh, I sometimes think you could do some dredging out there and, and ex experimental dredging to see if you could reduce their, their populations, but they're so abundant you would think some fish and birds would, would, would be able to regulate numbers, but they haven't so far. So we haven't seen the ecosystem settle down, I guess, to a point, to an equilibrium type uh, that, we, that, we, that we'd like. <laughs> Because that's really what involves choice, trying to figure out what is the ecosystem we want out there, what players do we want to be abundant, which ones do we want not to be abundant, then see if we can find ways to manipulate that. Yeah, and the trick is that that to define their habitats narrowly enough yeah. so that you can isolate the native from the non-native, so your restoration doesn't just grow more silver sides or yeah. some other non-native. You don't have to actually important not have to think about separating natives and non-natives because many of these species are compatible. Uh, American shad, for example, fit in well with the with with the smelt and so forth. Striped bass are another good example of a species that actually fits in in, in pretty well. Um, perhaps what we need to be need to be thinking of is. Um, what what are the species that, that really make a difference that we could really really do something about the silver size is one I don't know what you do with it because it's everywhere. Um, maybe you can harvest it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there, there are large scale problems out there that are very hard to deal with. Thanks. Yeah. Very helpful insights. Thanks, <clears throat> Joe. Yeah, so first, uh, I have to apologize. I'm not. I, my my knowledge about fish is minimal, but I did enjoy the two presentations. I mean, they're very <laughs> very informative. I would say, I was I was wondering. You you showed twice the inflow outflow, flow in and flow out uh, graph. Twice you showed, sure. and I was trying to get some kind of idea what. It is related to the total population or specific species. Is there any correlation available? That could be very valuable. Yeah, there's uh, there's nothing more studied in the system than outflow uh, and, and inflow, but especially outflow because that replaces. People are always accusing the big pumps in the South Delta, uh, which send water to the southern part of the state and to the San Joaquin Valley as well as to Bay Area cities. They're always accusing that of being a main driver of the declines in fish populations. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly a contributor uh, because there's so much else going on. But there, but there is, you have all these invasive species, you have other things going on, and how much they're responding 
to the changes in the environment that reflect diversions is, is always one of the questions because you the, the diversions in the South Delta, uh, these big pumping plants are just part of the problem. You have, you know, you, the, every river in California has a big dam on it. Uh, and that regulates regulates flows in the rivers and regulates all kinds of things that, have, that affect fishes in the Delta because the Delta fishes like the salmon is the best example. Are, are, their numbers are also tied to what happens upstream as well as what goes on in, in, the, in the Delta. So it's it's a very difficult well, thing to thing to deal with, um, but uh, but there is a certain correlation has been yeah found. yeah yeah thank you yeah. Uh, Tom, go ahead. My question has has to do with temperature, and clearly we have a situation where we're managing a system now, or we're in control of it. And um, the things we can control are, are things like water quantity going into yeah. the Delta. Uh, and, and salinity, of course, is a big uh, thing that we're controlling today. But I'm hearing more and more about temperature and I'm beginning to think that maybe that's something that we should actually uh, be regulating. It, would, you, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, uh, that's, that's the new big, big factor uh, people are, finally considering in models and so forth uh, of the delta. It's because delta smelt is a good example, is a species, that's basically a cool water species. So when you temperatures get much above 22, 23 degrees, um, you, it, 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 the physiological studies suggest they, they start having problems. So, and that was not, not anything, anything considered in the past really much for these fish, except for the, perhaps the salmonids. <clears throat> but it's always assumed that temperatures were adequate uh, in the estuary, you know, partly because you, you get the coastal, all these coastal effects which cool things down. But the delta is becoming increasingly more lake-like, you know, with all the levees and, and so forth, um, which have made, made it more prone to higher temperatures. Many parts of the system are really, really quite warm. I had thought that for in the San Joaquin side, for example, out migrating juvenile salmon don't make it through the delta in part because uh, the temperatures are, temperatures are just getting too warm. And not only is it, and, and of course that also makes them more vulnerable to predators if you're sort of stressed because of, 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 high, of the high temperatures. So yeah, I agree with you, temperature there and something that needs to be considered in, in models and any, any kind of planning in the system because the water is going to get warmer with climate change unless we want to directly uh, release more water from the big dams. And that's not going to happen. <laughs> Thank you. So I can, Peter, oh, I'm just going to comment on question. Okay, go ahead. Going to comment on Tom's comment. Uh, in Oregon streams, the uh, temperature is considered a basic water quality uh, uh, parameter that's regulated for uh, for restoration or for a variety of other things. It's almost considered like a TMDL, but it's um, specifically for salmonid fishes. Well, that's done in California too, <clears throat> but it's hard to regulate the temperatures of the, of the system of the Delta and the estuary. That's, that's a fundamental issue there. You just have to recognize it's a problem. So Peter, you've alluded to a few times uh, this idea that there are competing forces driving population levels. Do you think we have the kind of studies that if we, if we had an integrative model, that there are enough studies to say, well, we think the pumps kill X percent and we think temperature kills X percent. Do we have those kinds of studies that um, might help us put it all into one model? There certainly are studies like that. I'm trying to think of ones that are more specifically do that. <clears throat> um, Certainly, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of efforts been made to, to, to evaluate the different factors in, in using models of various sorts. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of, and this may reflect my ignorance, um, uh, I'm not aware of any grand model that's out there working on everything, like the one that um, Andre presented. I know there are people who worked on similar models out here, but I haven't seen anything quite on the scope of what, what he's put together. So maybe that's something I'm sure there's room for. Um, 
and I, I know the, um, uh, the, 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 they've been big on, big on conceptual models here in this system. So there have been some very major efforts funded on conceptual models of how the system works and ver various pieces of it work. But I'm not aware if those conceptual models have been turned into large scale quantitative models. I wouldn't be surprised if they have, but it's not something I track. Okay, thanks. Sticking my neck out a little to see if I can pull yeah. the pieces together. Uh, so we'll keep exploring that. I mean, basically, yeah. the fact that you didn't say that's a total waste of time it lets us continue to explore that question. So thank no, you. I, 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 it's not a waste of time. It's just that it's, it's so complex and so changing so fast. It's just hard to keep up with things. But maybe a good model could do that. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit that is a mind shift for me because even though we have high, all fisheries have very high variability, the idea of constantly new species is very different. So that is, is very helpful to learn from you, yeah. John. Uh, anything else? I mean, I would invite Andre, you want to say anything? Uh, you, <laughs> you've been listening carefully. Uh, yeah, no, I guess maybe just a couple of thoughts and comments that came to mind. And uh, Peter, I also enjoyed the presentation, uh, still getting to know my California fishes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I guess a couple of thoughts, you know, from uh, with those kind of correlations among species and these hypothesized drivers of how the system has changed. Uh, if you have the data going back, like building one of the, a model specifically for the Delta can help you address some of those hypotheses. You know, how, how can you best match the historical trends in these different species that have big, have had big contrast? Um, you've seen a big explosion of this or that. Mm -hmm. um, at least from the food web side of things, you could see under what conditions you can best match the historical data um, and if you're not seeing, man, th these models are all crap. They're not fitting well at all. Um, I mean, certainly the habitat stuff, as Peter's kind of emphasized, is really critical. Um, and, you know, but from a food web perspective, you could use it to kind of address those hypotheses. Sure. Um, and then maybe just another comment, too, just to make it clear that, you know, the model that we build is on this kind of large, grand scale. Um, you know, Chesapeake Bay has its own, you know, food web models and that kind of stuff. So you do have these kind of, you know, smaller, more localized models. But um, it does seem like that, that that may be an interesting, at least a, a place to start pursuing and just asking the question of like, what's available, would it be feasible, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. There's a lot, of, a lot of need for really good models out there. But again, I, I always point for the food web models, especially there's been again, a lot of conceptual models created. Uh, and but I always look at it from the perspective of, of the species of striped bass, for example, in again in Susie and Marsh, if you look at the we've looked at the diets of the adult striped bass out there, they're feeding primarily on, on sticklebacks, which are a native fish, and secondarily on a non-native goby. The sticklebacks are feeding primarily on non-native copepods. And so you got this food web that's made of mixtures of native and non-native species, which can change very quickly. I mean, the species of copepods have turned over completely in the system since I started working on it back in the 1970s. So, and as far as we know, these non-native these non-native copepods are fully integrated in the system and do things pretty much like the original species did. At least the fish don't care, but it does show you that there's this continual a very dynamic system out there that it creates hazards for modelers. <laughs> yeah, and just uh, another quick comment too is um, the the species specific nature, right? The invasive species. It's like here's one species, and you know, a lot of times we end up aggregating, you know, by functional group, right? Uh, small pelagic <laughs> forage fishes, you know, like the Delta smell versus long fin smelt and the, um, the silver side, like differ differentiating that I think might be too high, 
too high of a resolution for these kind of core a course model like like what we've talked about but you know the the functional group aspect uh, is in the in the sense of this novel ecosystem right there they're filling these different ecological niches right. like the copepods an interesting example but um yeah it's it, it's it's quite the quite the interesting system yeah we've actually published a study on on, on essentially guilds in the um, in, in the fish fauna, and found that these guilds were based on based on a combination of diet and habitat use and so forth. <clears throat> and you find that uh, the native and non-native fishes are all mixed up in those guilds. But the different and, and, and but within the guild, given guild, you tend to have a, some a certain amount of segregation among the species in terms of habitat and diet and so forth. So. That, that to me as an ecologist has been what, what's been pretty impressive that what we've learned is that these native and non-native species do form functional systems very quickly, which, which suggests that's part of the adaptations these temperate zone fishes have in general is the ability to get along with other fish. Well, thank you to Peter and Andre both for just a really thought-provoking uh, set of presentations. I guess with that, we'll wrap this up. Are there any public comments, Edwin, or questions? There are none. All right, well, then I'll hand it back to Steve. Well, thanks, Lisa, and uh, thanks again, uh, Peter and Andre, really uh, stimulating discussion. And uh, I think you've triggered a lot of ideas in our minds, so thanks for uh, joining us. Um, are there any public comments, Edmund, for things not on the agenda? There are none. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to wrap up and uh, we'll adjourn today's meetings. Thanks everyone for hanging in there all day. Yeah, thank you. I'm impressed you stuck it out. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>